Hey, Pen, I have an extra one here someplace. Not sure as I just stole it. <laughs> oh, you do? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think we should uh, open the meeting, guys. Jamie, ready? Uh, Jamie's up. Jamie? He's ready. We set? Okay. It's after 7 o'clock, and I'd like to uh, let you know that we went into an executive session at 6.45, came out about two minutes after 7, and we'd now like to open the regular session. During the executive session, we discussed uh, <coughs> options in potential contracts with the new town administrator applicants that we're dealing with, or will be dealing with, I should say. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask us to, everyone to stand so we can do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Is anyone here for weekly briefings? Chief Clark. Good evening. Uh, just um, briefly tonight, I wanted to let you know uh, we're in the process of applying for several grants, uh, ranging from uh, some public education all the way up to um, some ambulances. So uh, instead of trying to sit here and reiterate what happening I, I thought I'd bring a couple of the key players and to let them just talk to you directly about uh, wh where we're at and what we're doing uh, Captain LeBlanc and firefighter Deering are uh, the key players in a lot of the grant writing we've done over the years and been very successful so I'd like to let them uh, briefly explain to where we're where we are with the grants thank you Hello, um, I'm Firefighter Deering. I wrote uh, last year for the SAFE grant, which is the Student Awareness of Fire Education. It's a program that's been in existence in Massachusetts since 1995. And in that time, they've had a 70% decrease in deaths in children under 18. Um, Harwich, I don't believe, has ever applied for this grant. So this year, we were awarded a planning grant. We're able to send two of us to the public fire educator class that the Mass Fire Academy puts on. Next year, we applied for a grant that's a little bit more money, and it will get us into the schools to work with the teachers to teach the children public fire and life safety education. We were also able to apply for a grant that is um, $1,800. It's a new program this year. It's a senior <coughs> safe grant, so it targets our senior population with specific hazards for them. So that's the grant that we're waiting on hearing on now, the Senior Safe and Next Year's Safe grant. So hopefully we'll hear in the next couple of weeks here. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to mention on the educational grants, um, she's working with her uh, counterpart at the Chatham Fire Department, uh, Firefighter Tavano. So we're going to, through the Monomoy system, try and have a joint program uh, for uh, education in the Monomoy district. It's terrific. Makes a lot of sense. Good evening. I'll, uh, I'll try and be quick. Um, the grant program, I, I was here a couple months ago and showed you the thermal imaging cameras that we had received through the grant. Um, that opens yearly. It's funded by the federal government. It's called the Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program. Um, we have, since its inception, received over $300,000 in grant award money for different projects from training, thermal imaging cameras. We uh, built a backup radio system. Uh, this year we decided um, to seek, there's, there's several different programs within the grant that you can apply for. Uh, we are applying for a regional radio grant with the towns from Dennis to Wellfleet, so seven towns. Um, the radio system that we currently use is the State, Mass State Police uh, 800 trunking system. The majority of the radios that are in use in the system by all the towns are uh, were an original issue radios. They're no longer being uh, maintained or supported by Motorola. So they're at end of life. We need to replace them. We were able in 2010 to replace some of our radios. We're going to try and replace the rest with this grant. Um, our total of the grant is almost a million dollars. 
the total funds being sought. Our, the Harwich portion of the grant would be about 147,000, and the, the uh, town's obligation would be 10 percent, so about 14,000. So it's, it's a significant bang for the buck for us if we can if we can go through and, and with working with the seven towns, the regional grants are uh, much preferred by the federal government versus individual town grants. Locally, um, back in 2007 and 2008, the town um, at town meeting spent $80,000 in each town meeting to upgrade our, uh, our breathing apparatus. Since that time, the NFPA has uh, changed this standard twice. And since that time, there were 12 air packs that we didn't upgrade at the time. We kept, you know, they're, they're under the old standard. Um, with a local grant, we'd like to try and write uh, to replace the remaining 12 air packs. That would give us 12 new air packs with the current standards. We put them on the first two apparatus where it's going to have the, uh, the best impact for the firefighters that are on duty. Um, with that would also be some training money, probably about twenty-five dollars or $30,000 in training money, which allows us to get up to the fire academy and do live fire training, which we try and sneak into every grant. Well, it's not sneaking in. It's the federal government enjoys grants that have training attached to them because they see it as a, as a primary focus. And um, so it kind of allows us to kill two birds with one stone, upgrade our equipment, get some good training, and training with the new equipment that we purchase. Uh, the last grant, um, you can also write separately from one's called safety and operations, the other's vehicle grants. Vehicle grants are very difficult to get. Um, there were 4,000 submitted last year, of 4,000, 100 were awarded. They prefer to spend um, the money on, you know, spend more smaller chunks of money and benefit more departments than less. But um, looking at the, the age of our ambulances, there's a new priority this year to allow fire departments that run EMS as a primary to replace their ambulances. We have two that are up over 100,000 uh, miles. So the thought was we could write a grant. If we're successful, which is a long shot, um, we'd be able to have you know, a pretty solid ambulance fleet. Um, since we're already writing a safety and operations grant, it's just a matter of changing the narratives a little bit, and it's, it's not really any additional work, so it's almost to, to submit it isn't, you know, any additional effort, and it's another opportunity that would allow us to, to save the town, you know, close to $600,000. Our match on that would be about $33,000, and that would be a uh, $650,000 grant, which would also include uh, driver training for all the members of the department because it's a requirement of any vehicle grant that's awarded. Um, that's the program. If you have any questions, feel free to add, you know, answer them, but I uh, just want to let you know what that was. Thank you. You're welcome. Better, Chief? As we progress through these, uh, the grant process, we'll, we'll uh, 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 keep the town administrator and the board up to date. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you, because that's a lot of work and a complicated uh, listing of grant uh, work. So I uh, appreciate the effort. Anyone else here for weekly briefing? Carolyn? Hi, last week I reminded you all that we were having the Halloween party on uh, Thursday, starting at 3.30. What I neglected to mention is that we are still seeking volunteers to help with that. So if any people in the uh, community would like to come out and help, we need people to help pick up the pizzas and things like that. We did get over $500 worth of candy donated from Shaw's Market, a lot of our local um, Restaurants donate food for the event, so it's a it's a great community effort. Over 300 children usually come, so if anyone can help, please come on over. We can put you to work. What time? Yeah. Uh, the event starts at 3:30. If you can help, if you could be there by three o'clock. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? All right. If not, we'll move on to public comment and announcements. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Christopher LeClaire, and uh, I am the coordinator of the students and friends of the Harwich High School Hillary M. Pop LeClaire Gymnasium. You might be asking, what's this all about? Well, basically what uh, our objective is, is that for the rededication of the current Harwich High School Hillary M. Pop LeClaire Gymnasium for next year's fall of 2014 grand opening of the newly built and expanded Monomoy Regional High School Gymnasium. So we're here today um, to ask that we be placed on next week's agenda to uh, go over a little bit more on our objectives and have a lot of these people uh, 
former students, friends, associates, colleagues of Pop LeClaire to speak on behalf of this uh, exciting uh, endeavor. So I guess uh, I called the uh, town manager's office today and the polite lady said I can either uh, submit this via US, parse, uh, US mail or uh, walk it in and present myself to you guys and ladies. And I have some packets here that uh, go in depth more on what we're uh, seeking. Okay. So is this uh, the correct protocol or? Uh, Ed, I'm sorry. Um, I, guess, I guess the basic question is, this is no longer a town facility. I understand it's regional, regionalization. Yeah, uh, so the, the, pe the only the people that can make that decision are the regional school board. Okay. Uh, we also have a letter here from, I, I heard your answer to that. So the Board of Selectmen, Harwich Board of Selectmen, and the Chatham Board of Selectmen would not be the two venues to make this decision? Because in 1972, we have the letter from the late Bob Griffin and the other two selectmen that um, basically endorsed and honored uh, Pop LeClaire for the uh, yeah, so. dedication of the, the, current, the current gym for uh, his 40, 40 years of teaching and uh, coaching varsity sports, Pop LeClaire. I think Ed is absolutely correct. We don't have any control there's, over There's that no control all. whatsoever. We would like to know what you're you're doing and would you like the packet sir we, we i think yeah we'd love to have a package and okay see, see what's going on but i don't don't expect that we can do anything about it is what I'm okay saying. very good but peter any other questions the one, the one thing we could do is is put it on the agenda for next sure. week have a presentation on it and if we decide as a board to write a letter of recommendation to the Monomo regional school district that they you know they name it you know name the gymnasium that way we, Which is something that we could do, that but we don't we, have that, the that would be outstanding. We don't have the authority to actually name it. Okay, very good. Well, I appreciate your time, and so we could be placed on the agenda for next week. Well, it would be handy if you gave a packet to our town administrator. Okay, you said you had a packet there, and next week's okay. And, right? and, and we'll take a look at that and uh, and uh, make a judgment on that. Well, is, it, is, a, is, sure. is it all right if I approach you, sir? Okay. okay. Oh. So. Mr. Uh, yes. Chairman, um, I guess just um, just as a way of warning, uh, I know the in as we've gone through the process of regionalizing, um, there has been a, a discussion amongst the regional school uh, committee and and uh, the administrators involved. Uh, is to try and uh, uh, create a new tradition mm -hmm. rather than bring past traditions from either of the two high schools, thus alienating one or the other um, towns. And so just so you're aware, they're going to be very sensitive on that point. I understand, sir. I've talked to several other peoples within the venues, and they, uh, there's several different options thrown up in the air. There's uh, the Hall of Fame, um, there are lobbies. I know we're going to congregate uh, trophy cases from both. I'm a Chatham High School grad myself, um, so I'm fully aware of former coaches, uh, Coach Rose, Coach Jan Nickerson, and uh, their predecessor, obviously, Paul LeClaire, ironically, who is my grandfather, just happens to be. Um, <laughs> so that's that, but again, anyways, uh, make this short and uh, in closing. Uh, we do have quite a few um, Harwich Town residents that are, st are former students of POPs that would love to be able to talk and uh, give, their, give their side on it, but um, I think definitely we need to have a lot more dialogue and discussion on the table. And obviously, if we could get a letter of support from the Board of Selectmen from Harwich, that would be super. So um, will we be informed if yep. yay or nay on it, uh, being on the agenda for next week? Or? Well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll... You probably okay. will you be my on contact the agenda. The only, uh, uh, the only reason I'm hesitating is <clears throat> it depends on the, what else has to be on the agenda. So I understand. But you, you will know in a couple of days. Okay, super, because then we can uh, certainly let everybody know because there are people that are upwards of 88 and 89 years old that would love to come and uh, join you and speak with you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I... 
I think you've all seen the paper uh, Saturday morning that we, uh, uh, Chatham and Harwich uh, was granted, uh, were granted $3.3 million to help in the construction of the Muddy Creek uh, Bridge, uh, which is great news. Uh, a little uh, uh, background on that, the funding comes uh, through the uh, Division of Fish and Game and uh, Department of Interior kind of rolls downhill from Washington, but as part of uh, money set aside for the Hurricane Sandy. And uh, I know my first question was, Hurricane Sandy, we of course weren't uh, affected by that directly here, but uh, Congress in the uh, funding of uh, the remedial action for Hurricane Sandy, which was in the billions of dollars, uh, set aside 300 million uh, for uh, uh, work to protect uh, areas in the future. And uh, that, uh, through the grant process, a lot of uh, allowing tidal flow to go in, but also to go out if we have a hurricane surge was seen as being protective of uh, Muddy Creek. Uh, and so it went forward. The uh, conditions are that uh, there's no match for Harwich or Chatham, which is good news for us. We will have a, uh, a three-year time period to uh, uh, construct a bridge. Uh, the starting date for that has not yet been uh, set. Uh, we hope it will be set when they, when they give us the money. Uh, I think, as you recall, a town meeting, both towns uh, appropriated money uh, last year uh, to design the bridge. Uh, we've, that's going forward in our... Uh, schedule now is to have that design completed by the first quarter of uh, next year, uh, possibly sooner, uh, hopefully in January, but uh, I'm, I'm always skeptical of deadlines. Uh, so we can put that on the town. Uh, we can move ahead with the bridge on the town uh, warrant next spring and start at uh, uh, the fall of 2014 and uh, construct it over the, uh, over the winter. The uh, total amount of the grant was about $3.8 million. Uh, money is taken aside, uh, withdrawn from that as overhead, both for the Fish and uh, uh, Game Department of Massachusetts and the uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, USDA. So we get the final part of $3.3 million. Uh, just to uh, restate, we were uh, moving ahead with that uh, project with or without uh, funding help from the uh, from outside of Harwich, so this obviously helps us out. I do need to be very uh, clear in, uh, in thanking people involved on this. We have a uh, Chatham Harwich uh, committee that worked on it, but more importantly, the uh, uh, person coordinating that for us is uh, Carol Ridley, who's done a good job of pulling that together, deserves uh, uh, credit. She uh, spent time uh, applying for this grant, but also for a series of grants. This was, of, of our wishes, this is the best grant for us. The others had matching funds that were much more limited in scope. Uh, but in addition to that, we need to give specific uh, uh, congratulations and our thanks to Jeremy Bell, who's the uh, Wetland Restoration Program Manager for the Division of Fish and Game uh, in Massachusetts. And I wanted to read his uh, full title because he did uh, almost uh, certainly the significant part of the grunt work of putting it together the grant, uh, writing it, uh, submitting it, following it, and putting that through. The second uh, name, a uh, uh, person outside of our immediate group, is Martha Reinhardt. Uh, she's in the uh, uh, USDA. She also helped with the grant. Martha, I see uh, Dave Young and Peter and other people out there. She helped us uh, do the work on Red River Beach and put that together for us. And so she's uh, been, as did Jeremy, that work effort is probably uh, uh, more widely split, but it's a, uh, they did a lot of work and uh, uh, we need to, uh, in fact, I, I, I would suggest we send uh, certainly Jeremy a thank you note because they've spent a lot of, and Martha spent a lot of time and effort on that. But it's uh, good news for us and we'll, uh, we'll move ahead. It, I know I'm looking forward to having a town article that when they, I'm sure as Linda will, will say, what's the source of funds that uh, I can stand up and, and answer that question? Thank you, Larry. We'll put it in the article. <laughs> and put it in the article. Uh, are we all done now with weekly briefing? 
uh, and public comments. We'll now move to the cons no. no, okay. Hi, I'm Candace Wolcott. I live on Pleasant Lake Avenue. We talked last week. Unfortunately, the public comment section of your agenda was deleted due to a disc error, and the minutes won't be construed from it because clearly they're done from the recorded element. So I just wanted to reiterate, number one, that you know, several of us came up and spoke to you, and we had great discourse, you, you know, and Peter, and I, you know, I think that there was some reasonable discussion. And unfortunately, that was omitted from the televised portion of your town meeting. I mean, excuse me, your selectman's meeting. But in that, I was very pleased that you said you were gonna set aside a specific date <coughs> to address this 124 project on November 18th. My concern is you decided to have it in this room. I think that the outpouring of concern is going to um, require a bigger room. I don't think this is the appropriate forum for the number of people that may be here to see number one, the presentation, and number two, ask questions. Well, let me interrupt you for a moment. Well, we realize that too, and fortunately the community center uh, multi-purpose room is available. It's available, that's And tonight. Caroline, is, who's right here, who, who runs the community center, okay. has organized that, okay. that to occur. Awesome. And what, what we're trying to do is to figure out, because it's a difficult room in which to run presentations, have a meeting, and have uh, a conversation. So Carolyn's trying to figure out really how to set that, that room up so it could okay. give everybody the, the best shot. But yeah, that's, that's what the plan is. Okay, great. All right, thank you. I, I, I w by the way, I was not aware, I don't know if anybody else was aware of the, the difficulty with the, uh, this is the first we've heard about the difficulty with that tape. Yeah, no, there's the, um, the public, the whole task oh. hmm. It was a good meeting, as a matter of fact. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Ann Stewart, 518 Pleasant Lake Ave. Along those lines, um, yeah, I, I wanted to make it known that there's been some uh, press this week about an individual that was concerned that she felt that she didn't have a chance to really understand some of the, um, the uh, remarks that were made or, or get an understanding of the plans that were brought forth on October 16th with Mr. Hooper and Mr. Magney, she felt that because other people got up and expressed their views about the 124 <coughs> project that that was inappropriate. So I wanted to clarify for this individual and then for also for other individuals that may have felt that those, you know, the people who got up and spoke with a mic were acting inappropriately. Um, this is got, it, it will be new for Mr. McManus. I, I asked the rest of the board to bear with me. I'd like to have these two records, or letters that I have on public record. I'll read fast. I have a letter from uh, myself to Mr. LaMancia dated July 25th. Dear Chairman of Butters to Route 24, Pleasant Lake Ave in Harwich, earnestly request an opportunity to meet with the selectmen to address our mutual concerns about the proposed Route 124 renovations. We feel that time is of the essence in this matter. I will therefore look forward to hearing of a date when we may approach the board. Sincerely, Ann Stewart. On August 1st, I received a letter from Mr. Robert C. Lawton. Dear Ms. Stewart, the Harwich Board of Selectmen is in receipt of your debtor letter dated July 25th, 2013, in which you request to meet with the board regarding proposed reconstruction of Route 124. The Board of Selectmen discussed your request and felt that the appropriate forum to address any concerns you and any abutters may have is at the several public meetings to be held on the proposed project. Public meetings will be scheduled by the highway director, Lincoln Hooper, after a plan is developed. At that time, abutters will be notified of these meetings and they will be advertised in the Cape Cod Chronicle. Sincerely, Robert C. Lawton. I just wanted to have that on record that we did have permission to speak at that meeting. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, Steve Lennon, uh, 490 Pleasant Lake Avenue. I want to thank three of the selectmen for taking the time to walk the 124 uh, stretch because I think that uh, 
a lot will come from that. And uh, just wanted to thank you for taking the time to do that. Appreciate that. Well, there were four of us. <laughs> just to keep the record straight. But thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right. Let's move to the consent agenda. Peter? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would move the following uh, consent agenda. Items A, approved minutes of 1 September 30th, 2013, regular meeting, uh, 2 October 7th, 2013, regular meeting, 3 October 7th, 2013, executive session, 4 October 15th, 2013, regular meeting, 5 October 15th, 2013, executive session, uh, 6 October 19, 2013, the walking tour of 124. Uh, B, a vote to approve the request by Anstar Electric to provide underground service to 29 Hiawatha Road. And C, vote to award contract for the FY14 road salt contract to Eastern Minerals in the amount of $53 <coughs> per delivered ton. Second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Uh, we now move to the public hearing and presentations section of our uh, agenda. Uh, the first report is a report of our uh, search committee regarding uh, candidates for the town administrator position. Mr. Wheeler. Congratulations. The lights are going to Can you uh, flick? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a, uh, a pleasure to be back with you again to uh, discuss the work uh, of the search committee on behalf of the subcommittee of the Board of Selectmen uh, to review and come with a list of individuals who we believe have the qualities and characteristics and experience that would make them a success in the corner office downstairs as town administrator for Harwich. What I want to do this... Uh, Hold one second. Before we get started, I want to recognize certain individuals who have, not only through this round, but also the previous round of this search, have committed an awful lot of time and energy and expertise to this process. From, the, from round one, we had five individuals who remained on the committee uh, to, uh, to, um, in this undertaking, and they are Leo, I don't know who, how many are in the room today, but Leo Pagunas, Shirley Gomes, Chris Joyce, Tom Johnson, I know you're here, Tom, somewhere. We just left, okay, just stepped out, and myself. I also want to recognize the Harwich Chamber of Commerce who provided us access to their executive conference room to do the interviews. Uh, as you know, we had to maintain the confidentiality of all, the, of all of the candidates at their request, and uh, in, a, in a, an effort to do that, they were very courteous and allowed us the use of that facility. In addition to that, in addition to working with Mark Morris from MMA Consulting, the company hired to, to, to uh, drive this search, Bob Lawton came in um, on the day we spent reviewing 51 resumes and helped us with, with uh, some sp in input on specific candidates as well as the process, which really helped us immeasurably. So thank you, Bob. Appreciate that very much. We caught him just as he was about ready to go out the door, I think, that day. So it was very nice. I want to share with you the committee charge again, just a level set with all of you. And uh, then to give you, uh, I, again, a sense of the guidelines that we follow that drove the, our day-to-day -day, uh, activities, uh, give you a sense of the competencies that drove the question set that we probed with each of the candidates to determine whether they had the stuff, if you will, to make it maybe be successful in, uh, in, in the town of Harwich. Then I'll share with you some highlights of the process that we followed, and most importantly, at the end, I'll share with you the results, the list, the names of the finalists, and give you a little bit of background as to who they are. So with that. The charge, and again, this is what you as the board gave to us. And I'm not going to read all of it, but basically it's just says to give you a list of qualified candidates for this position, a minimum, a minimum of three. And one of the things you also did, you authorized every, uh, us to go back and review the resumes from the previous round if we thought that would add to our process. So, and there was, there was some limited review of the previous resumes as well. So that was the charge. 
And tonight we're delivering that to you. Guidelines. One of the things that we did early on in, the, in round one was to agree on a process for how we we're going to do this. And we made sure we made a commitment as a, individually and as a committee to follow that process. And early on in that process, we had uh, John Giorgio come down and talk about open meeting law, the things you can do and things you cannot do. And we, we held to that religiously in terms of open meetings, in terms of executive session, and so on and so forth. We worked with Mark Morse to generate the list of potential candidates. And we said the candidates can come from both the public and the private sector because we felt as though there may be some people in the public sector who may have the expertise that we need in this position. In addition to what we learned from the resume reviews and any other background information we did, we uh, probed Mark Morris for any additional insights that he might have had on individual candidates, which helped us to better appreciate why a person was considered to be a, uh, uh, a better candidate, more qualified candidate versus a less qualified candidate, and so on. Because in addition to the 50, well, of the 51, he might have recommended a certain number. I'll give you that number in a minute. But we said we looked at all of the resumes, all of them. That's 51. And uh, as I mentioned before, we utilized Bob, okay, as an advisor to the committee, which we appreciated very much. Additional guidelines, uh, it, we were asked by more than one candidate to maintain their confidentiality. So as such, we did that. And at, at no time did we share names of any of the candidates until tonight, other than the, uh, the confidential packages which you received late last week. Other than that, no names have been released, and no names will be released for those other than uh, the ones that will be presented tonight. Each of the people I'm going to mention tonight are aware of the fact that their confidentiality now is that that whole law is now gone in the sense that everything now is going to be open meeting and their names are out in the open, and they, and they were comfortable with that. And then I guess last, uh, on the second to last, we committed early on, uh, both Linda when you were chair and also Angela as you as chair, that if we didn't find during this schedule that we had a sufficient number of qualified candidates, we would continue the process. While we recognize you need to get the job done, we also said we got to bring quali quality people to you so you can make the decision. And then also, as I mentioned before, a minimal discussion of the process and our findings with outside people. That included the Board of Selectmen. So there was a line of separation for all of you in the audience between the committee and the Board of Selectmen relative to what we were doing, how we were doing it, and the results therefrom. These are the key competencies which came from the document which Mark Morse put together originally from interviews with department heads, other town employees, um, and the Board of Selectmen, as well as members of the search committee. We want to make sure that they've got the right education, training, and experience to do this job, and that they've shown leadership skills. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these. I think you can read them faster than I can. Uh, one key point is we didn't want them to be just tactical thinkers. We want them to be able to look forward strategically and, uh, and be somewhat of a visionary to say, okay, what can po where, 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 is, where could, could Harwich possibly go, and how can we best get there if we work collectively together to make it happen? So we're interested in strategic thinkers, but also people who have a focus also in making it happen. They understand the tactics, and they have shown expertise in getting the job done. There's a question that we asked of each of the, um, uh, each of the candidates regarding what, how did you use creativity and innovation to solve a problem within the town in which you are a town administrator or a town manager? And we got some interesting responses to that. We want some thinking outside the box, not just that oh, we've always done it that way. And we got some very interesting responses. Communication skills, both oral and written. So we observed them in terms of how they pre presented themselves in front of us in 60 minutes of being asked some very difficult questions, as well as how they communicated in written, uh, in written formats as well because we know that's going to be crit critical in the, uh, to be successful in this job. A key point, you see the word demonstrated. We didn't ask, how would you? We said, in your experience, how have you? And we asked for specific examples of how they've managed uh, complex organizations, how they've managed budgets. Each of the people we're going to bring before you now uh, or tonight understands Prop 2 and a half, mass municipal law. They practice it every single day. Okay? They understand about capital... Um, 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 exclusions and those sorts of things in terms of the financial side. My point is this, is that they've got strong uh, manage, uh, fiscal management backgrounds. That they delegate and they follow up with the people that they delegate to. They have a performance management orientation. If I give you a job to do, I give you the, school, the tools uh, and the capabilities to perform that job, I'm going to hold you accountable. It's very, very, we felt that was very important. Ongoing communication with department heads that they've done, they've been involved in a negotiation bargaining process. Um, that uh, they've communicated town policies uh, and plans with all stakeholders. That's employees, that's with, uh, with other towns, with the region, if, if that be the case, and also with uh, taxpayers. 
and the business community, and that they've applied those policies to, to, to the towns, that they clearly understand Massachusetts municipal law. If that's one of the things that we learned, okay, in the last round, it's just critically important these people from day one understand the intricacies of Massachusetts municipal law because it is different than other states. And so that was, that was, those are key competencies that we looked at. In terms of the search process, please stop me if I, go on to, if I go too fast, okay, with this whole thing, but you've seen some of these before, so I don't want to belabor the point. We held an organization meeting on August 7th to basically re, re, uh, to level set with the committee to say, okay, round one didn't go as we expected. What are we going to do with round two? How are we going to proceed? And we all agreed on that. And we agreed we're going to use that, uh, the uh, characteristics document that MMA had created. That, yeah, as you know, the, uh, the, policy, the public vacancy notice was published in the appropriate uh, periodicals. Fit, we received 51 resumes by the cutoff date, which was September 20th. There is still a tremendous amount of interest in this position. One of those resumes was received from Washington State. So it goes across the country. For those of you who weren't here for round one, we received them from Florida, Arizona, Colorado, California, and so on. So there's a lot of interest in this position in the town of Harwich. We're a very desirable place to come. We selected the semifinalists for interviews. There were six of them from the 51 on, Oct on October 10th. It took us all day, or majority of the day, okay, to go through those 51 resumes in depth, discuss the pros and cons of each of those candidates, and agree on the six to be interviewed. We had those interviews on, uh, in our deliberations on the 23rd last week. And we uh, made a selection and notification um, of all those individuals. One of the key things that we wanted to make sure of is that when we decided who we want, wanted as the finalist candidates, we wanted to make sure that they were truly committed to this position. The worst thing that we could have happen is we pick X number of candidates to bring for you for consideration, and let's say two-thirds of them drop out for whatever reason, personal considerations, professional considerations, whatever it is. So we asked Mark Morse to get back to them to say, to, to, to let them know that they were selected tentatively as a finalist candidate and to get a sense of are you truly committed uh, to, this, to this process and to this position so we don't waste anybody's time. And all the individuals which I'm going to share with you tonight um, understand that. They understand the names are now going to be public. They also have committed to, um, to completing this process uh, through, through its end. Okay? Very important. And tonight on schedule, we're going to present the finalist submissions to uh, the finalist uh, candidates to you and Board of Select. Again, um, hold one second, please. I just want to repeat um, all of the people that I'm going to share with you now, there are three of them. All of them currently hold positions in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the, either the town manager or the town administrator level. They're all doing the job today and have been doing it for some time. No one's from out of state. Second, from a financial standpoint, they've lived all the joys and the otherwise of being in that position when it comes to fiscal management, human resources <coughs> management, policies, procedures, communication, et cetera, et cetera. They understand the dynamics of the position. Okay? So these are people who are tried and they've been proven. So. With that, let me share with you who those individuals are. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background as to who they are. First is Sharon Lynn. Sharon Lynn has 30 years of town management and municipal policing experience. She has been the town manager of Provincetown, Massachusetts for six and a half years. Prior to the assignment in Provincetown, she, uh, she was employed by West, by West Goshen Township, Pennsylvania for more than 20 years. She began her career as a police officer and serves, uh, served as a detective for 13 years. She served for 11 years as the assistant town manager and town manager of West Goshen. Sharon Lynn. Second, Christopher Clark. Christopher Clark has 20 years of municipal experience and has been the town manager of Southbridge, Massachusetts for the last five years. Prior to working in Southbridge, Mr. Clark was the town administrator in Vernon, Connecticut for two years and has worked as the assistant executive director an acting executive director, which is equivalent to the town administrator, in Wellesley, Massachusetts for approximately six years. Third, Alan Chaka. Alan Chaka has been the town administrator of Rockland, Massachusetts for, for five years. Prior to his employment in Rockland, Mr. Chaka had been in private business for approximately 20 years. He served as one term as the selectman in Bridgewater from 2001 to 2004 and served as a state representative for two terms from 1981 to 1984. 
Earlier in his career, he served as a legislative aide in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, and he's been active in community uh, affairs and has served on town government committees. Mr. Chaka owns a Bachelor of Science degree and a Bachelor of Public Administration degree. One other thing I might want to add, okay, is Ms. Christopher Clark also holds a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Master of Business Administration um, degree as well from, um, I'm not sure what, what, what university, but they have, they're, they're, they're degreed individuals. So we have Sharon Lynn from Provincetown, Christopher Clark from Southbridge, Massachusetts, and Alan Chaka from Rockland, Massachusetts. There's your three finalist candidates. Yes, Ed. Uh, do we know what uh, Ms. Lynn's educational background is? I don't have it with me. Oh, okay. I'm sure you can get it, though. I do not know. Other questions? Or no, we, we move from here, right? Yeah. I just I would like to say thank you. Uh, you know, you've worked very hard in this and the first round, uh, and it would be our hope that we don't have to do this again. Amen. So, <laughs> Amen. Amen. We feel really good about these three, these three, three candidates. We hope that you do as well, and we hope that the decision you have to make is a difficult one, for all the right reasons. Okay, because we believe that you're going to see some quality people when you interview them. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you. everybody in your team. And by the way, Mr. Johnson reappeared a second after you began speaking. Well, there he is, so, Tom Johnson. So he's here. Thank you, Tom. Um, <laughs> every, every, I'm sorry. And Mr. Kunis snuck oh, in. Oh, no. Leo's here, too. I'm, I'm sorry, Leo. Leo. I didn't see you. Uh, okay, I feel like It's unusual for Leo to come in quietly. I'm going to say we move quietly, but carry a big <laughs> stick. Angela, I, you know, uh, I want to thank the, the volunteers because it was a tremendous amount of time, and I especially want to thank Leo because this round of interviews came up right during his harvest season, and I know it's a tough time of year for a cranberry farmer. <laughs> Leo also lost his mother, too. I know. Right around the time we were getting together, so difficult times. What everyone should know is during the selectman session of this meeting, we, we're going to be discussing how we plan to uh, on this Friday, actually, uh, have uh, all the candidates come in in the morning, and meet a number of the department heads, and have us chaperone them around the town to, s to see what the town's like and, and, and try and get everybody to understand each other uh, better. And then that afternoon, we will have interviews, and then we hope to be able to move forward from that position. Uh, but we'll, we'll cover that later on. Thank you again. You're welcome. Really. Thanks. You're done. We now move to um, a show cause hearing for an all alcohol package store liquor license held by Harvest Fine Wines and Spirits. Peter, can you read the notice? Sure, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll read the notice for the show cause hearing. Uh, the Harts Board of Selectmen, acting as local licensing authority, will hold a show cause hearing on Monday, October 28, 2013, no earlier than 7 p.m. at Harwich Town Hall, Don B. Griffin Room, 732 Main Street, Harwich, Mass., 02645, for the purpose of determining if the annual all-alcohol package store license, now held by Harvest Fine Wines and Spirit, Inc., doing business as Harvest Fine Wines and Spirits, Richard P. Deegan, manager, located at 706 Main Street, Harwich, Mass., 02645, should be modified, suspended, or revoked. This hearing is being held in accordance with Mass Journal Laws, Chapter 138, Sections 15, 23, 64, and 77, Harwich Board of Selectmen Local Licensing Authority. Mr. Lawton, will you handle, please? Mr. Chairman, um, there are two show cause hearings this evening, and I had in your packet a memo from me dated October 24 outlining some of the process that we have been through regarding these two licenses. In the case of the Harwich Fine Wines and Spirits, um, we, we have been maybe backing up a little bit. We started this process in the middle of July. The board, uh, through various meetings, has granted several extensions on this hearing, the last one being 60 days. During that last 60 days, the board's instructions were that if the holders of the current holders of the licenses had any activity for transfer, turning the license in, et cetera, they should do it within that time. As of this evening, 
or as I'm sorry, as of Friday afternoon and then this afternoon, we have received a 90% complete request for a transfer for Mr. Deegan's license. Uh, the only, there are some minor items which need to be uh, placed within the file. So I guess at the last minute, this has, there has been an application filed with you. I might suggest to you that in this particular hearing that you uh, postpone action until the 12th of November. The reason for that would be that during that time this application could be finalized or not and if it is not then the board could take the action of revoking the license. Uh, so that would be my recommendation on this license for the Harwich Fine Wine and Spirits. Uh, I think we should ask if there is any, any comments. Uh, the if, if the uh, whole license holder is here, which I'm not sure that in this case he is or not, in my conversations with him he has discussed uh, the possibility of a transfer which occurred today. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm William Gens and I do not represent Mr. Deegan. I represent uh, Karen, who is the prospective transferee. Okay. Okay, this matter came to her attention fairly late in the game. If, if it had come any sooner, uh, we would have been much, much further along with this process. We had to really rush over the last 48 hours or so. Uh, Mr. Deegan really hasn't done what the board has wanted him to do. There's no dispute about that. But at least he has agreed in a letter of understanding to cooperate with us for an orderly transfer. So, uh, We've also been in touch with the landlord for the facility, and we believe that there'll be a, uh, there's a viable commitment there to get the space. Uh, what I'd like to do on behalf of, uh, of Ms. Roshan here, and uh, she's got members of her team here who have some experience in these matters, is to, uh, is to join at Mr. Lawton's request for just a little bit of time with, so that we can present you uh, our operation in its best light. This may not be the appropriate meeting to do that. No, I think if you wait to, I'm sorry. No, if, if the confirmation is from the attorney that he, in this case, is uh, ready, willing, and able to finalize the application, then you may wish Close to consider the November 12th date. I, yeah. This would not be a time for a presentation uh, on the, that's, on that's, the I'm license. I'm not going to make much of a presentation, that, but I want to, to have that opportunity in the future to do so. Well, you, you, you will on November hearing. No, November, uh, November 12th, well, excuse no, me. I think at, at that time, by that time, I will have to certify to you that the application has been submitted properly and all of the forms are completed. Uh -huh. Then we would, I would be suggesting some dates at which time you would hold a public hearing for the possible transfer of the license. Okay. All right. Because we wouldn't even be discussing it at that point because we have to do the notice, we have to do the public yes, hearing, and that takes That's correct. multiple okay. weeks. Right. Yes, ma'am. So, so we would have to calculate the date and then just yeah. tell you this is, we have received it. We've calculated this would be the date for your hearing. Because you, you, you do have a hearing on the 12th, not for this license, but for a, a, a different transfer. Uh, can we have a motion to? Need the hearing to the 12th of November. Yes. So. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Your, Aye. Your, your appearance is not wasted because it's nice to know there's interest. Okay. Uh, Peter should probably read the other show cause sure. notice now. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I read the next notice on a show cause hearing. The Harch Board of Selectmen acting as local licensing authority will hold a show cause hearing on Monday, October 28, 2013. No earlier, earlier than 7 p.m. at Harwich Town Hall, Don B. Griffin Room, 732 Main Street, Harwich, Mass. 02645, for the purpose of determining if the annual wine and malt package store license and seasonal all alcohol package store license now held by Harwich Spirit Shop, Inc., doing business as Harwich Spirit Shop, Bruce William Gibson, manager, located at <coughs> 574 Route 28, Harwich Port, Mass. 02646 should be modified, suspended, or revoked. This hearing is being held in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Sections 15, 23, 64, and 77, uh, the Harge Board of Selectmen Local Licensing Authority. Well, Mr. Chairman, in this case, unless there is someone here this evening representing Mr. Gibson or if Mr. Gibson is here, um, 
I have had no contact other than the, uh, with the office. One of the uh, administrative secretaries had received two phone calls from Mr. Gibson saying, at least in one case, he was going to turn in his license or at least not uh, challenge the Board of Selectmen at, uh, at a show cause hearing. So I'm not sure if Mr. Gibson or anyone representing Mr. Gibson is here this evening. Not seeing any, um, as the licensee has not exercised the license for some significant period of time, I'd suggest that the Board of Suckman vote to revoke this license. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Any discussion? Peter? Could, could I just ask, Bob, what was the uh, initial date when we contacted Mr. Gibson on this matter, just for the record? And my intent is to show that we're given sufficient, you know, time and notice. I'd have to will. look back through the... Uh, we On July 16th, 2013, was my first letter to Mr. Gibson. Uh, he responded on July 24th, indicating that he was going to uh, take some action to transfer the license. And subsequent to those dates, <coughs> we had letters uh, dated August 1st, 2013, uh, notifying Mr. Gibson that action needed to be taken. And then on, again on August 13th, regarding the show of cause hearing and then the bo and then August 28th where the Board of Selectmen granted the 30-day uh, time period and then there was this there was correspondence September 25th and I think my last correspondence to Mr. Gibson was October 3rd okay. for an so I think but the point is, do, do this notice has been going been on given. for three and a half months. Yes, sir. Yes. Without any positive traction, I guess, is the way no, I sir. would describe it. No, sir. You are correct. So. And this is different in that that business was sold at the end of June, I believe. So the business doesn't even exist. It so, does not, uh, to the best well, of the my knowledge. Well, the liquor license does, though. The liquor license oh. does, but the business itself is gone. The property was the building. The property was the sold. Building. Business. Business. Yeah. Yeah. So the business is basically at that location closed. And there is a, a motion and a second. Yes. Did, did we have... open the hearing? Yes, we did. Yeah. Okay. Did we close it? No, but we should. That one is not. No, we can close the hearing. Typically, we close the hearing before, before we have the discussion. Taking, taking a motion. I move to close the hearing. Second. second. Okay. Good point. All in favor? Aye. 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 I remove. We uh, revoke the license. Second. Any, f any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. The next uh, set of activities are annual meetings and little presentations from uh, th three of our committees. First one is the Youth Services Committee. Uh, <clears throat> good, good evening. I'm Jim Hartley from the Youth uh, Services. I would like to open my comments by acknowledging the recent passing of one of our members, Malcolm McDowell. Mm -hmm. Mac was a retired pastor, loving husband, and tireless advocate <clears throat> for youth. His compassionate and dedicated ministry informed the work with kids, families from Pennsylvania to New York to Cape Cod. His wisdom, kindness, and humor will be greatly missed by all of us. Harwich Youth Services Committee met seven times during the past 12 months, and the projects we collaborated on are in your package, which I believe you've got those yes, we uh, prior to this meeting. Harwich Youth Services Committee will continue to collaborate with the aforementioned organization to support, support healthy activities and social supports for the Harwich youth. These will include continued boys and girls nights for middle school kids, as well as community service projects. There will be many changes taking place with students in Harwich and Chatham beginning next school year as blended communities. Harwich Youth Services will be working with our partners in Chatham community coming together with both recreation departments to work toward the goal of maintaining and creating programs that promote health and safety. Um, just as a note, I wrote the original um, job specs for this position 14 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to try and answer them for you. Just a comment. I was reading your your mission statement, and I and I think I think it's a, a, an excellent mission statement, and you do a wonderful job moving towards it. Oh, thank you. Sure. 
Jim doesn't know that I'm going to say this. I'm Sheila House, the youth counselor, but he not only wrote the original um, job description, but he's been on Harvard Youth Services Committee for 15 years now. So I just want to publicly acknowledge him. Thank you. Thank you. So he started as a young man. Time <laughs> changes. <laughs> well, at least a younger man. <laughs> <laughs> We, we now move to the uh, next meeting, which is our cemetery commission. Presentation. Good evening, I'm Cindy Eldridge, um, Howard Cemetery Commissioner. Um, in response to how is your committee attendance, our committee is very well attended. Uh, in response to are you in need of new members or do you have enough membership now? No, we are not in need of any new members. We uh, all work together very well to get our com uh, tasks accomplished. Last year's activities over the past year, the commission has continued to focus on several fronts, including planting of 100 Leland Cypress trees in Evergreen Cemetery, installation of 20 monuments on Howland Children's Lot, Mount Pleasant Cemetery, grading and installation of topsoil and hydro seed in front of the newly installed fencing, the South Howitch land swap, Install drainage for Island Pond Cemetery and digitization mm -hmm. of Howitch Cemetery books. The ha South Howitch Cemetery land swap with Rich Roy has been completed and will be filed at the Barnstable County Registry of Deeds. Income for FY 2013 was 50300 Of that, 46350 from lot sales and administrative <coughs> administration fees, excuse me, which went into the evolving, revolving account and 3,950 went into the perpetual care account. That's an increase of $7,000 over the last year. Looking ahead, the commission's top priorities are to complete the Mount Pleasant project with additional grave spaces, installation of lot markers, and beautification of the entrance to the South Street entrance. Howard Center uh, Cemetery, to get that on the National Register, to make informational brochures of each of the town cemeteries with street maps and a design of the South Howard Cemetery expansion, continuing to update the town's burial records and a design of the veteran circle in the new Evergreen Cemetery section, the planting of trees and beautification of the entrance at Evergreen and the completion of the preservation and digitization, <coughs> excuse me, of the Howard Cemetery records books to be rebound and the original sent to the town clerk. Gravestone conservation in Howitch Center Cemetery and we, in, we anticipate an active year for the commission and our administrator as we continue our efforts to properly maintain and service the 17 existing town cemeteries and remain vigilant in making needed improvements to ensure sufficient resources of the town's future needs. Commission meets monthly at its office located at the town DPW garage on Queen Anne Road, and public input is most welcome. The cemetery department office is open five days a week from 8.15 to 2.15. Respectfully submitted from the Howitch Cemetery Commission, Wilfred Remillard, Chairman, Warren Nichols, Commissioner, Cynthia Aldridge, Commissioner, and Robin Kelly, Administrator. Thank you, any Thank questions you. or comments? Uh, uh, one question, uh, the digitization of the uh, cemetery books uh, you know, we're going through, we're working with Brooks Library to digitize their records and the uh, data clerks downstairs. I'm just interested, what type of, what, what will be the uses of, of these records? Uh, Let Robin who, answer that. <laughs> is it historical uh, records or is yeah. it up to so, date? Uh, some of the books date back to the early 1800s and there are a lot of information in there on to who really purchased the first lots, who was on those committees at the time. Um, we've gotten the disc back at this point. You can go in there and you could search Sydney Brooks anywhere on the tape that Sydney Brooks is on the disc. It'll search there and then you just hit the next one and it'll search to that. And, spot. and the process for doing that would be to contact you if I were interested in some I, I have three discs currently, so I'm going to be bringing one over to Desiree. One's going to be here at Town Hall and one will be at my office. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Peter? Robin, while you're up there, could I just ask uh, what we're doing with the ground penetrating radar at one time? That was a, a very important, you know, project and topic for you. Are you still using the, the equipment? Uh, we, we are still using the ground penetrating radar. We use it, um, we initially purchased it 
to find, um, in the winter time, we couldn't locate where the um, bodies were on the frozen ground, so it's easy to find them with the ground penetrating. You don't even have to probe the ground. You can see it's like an x-ray underneath. Um, uh, we took the money out of the um, perpetual care account, and then we made enough money renting it out to other towns to put all the money back in, so it paid for itself. Um, we currently had the town of Dennis ask us if we would do a couple of more. We've already scanned one cemetery for them, but they have additional cemeteries that they want scanned. Um, we haven't uh, lined up when we're actually going to have time to do that, um, but uh, hopefully it'll be soon. Thank you. Yes. Ed? Um, the, the disks and the digitization of the records, mm -hmm. is, is it uh, anticipated to some and put those online? Um, I wasn't anticipating putting them online. I don't know if um, where we would where we would put them up. I don't know if you could put them up on the website or not. I'm certain they could partition the area, yeah. uh, cemetery area off. I know, you know, the uh, assessor's uh, records. Um, are online. The registry of deeds books are online. It, I think it would make it a lot easier and more generally available. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, talk maybe to I'll talk to Jamie about that. Yeah. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Um, the other, the other, uh, in the report, it, you you indicate um, a Harwich Center Cemetery, which I think uh, for many people they they think of it as Island Pond but there's actually a distinction between the, the two. Yeah, they're two separate cemeteries. There's a Howitch Center Cemetery, um, I think, which is the oldest cemetery owned by the town. I think it was 17, late 1700s. <laughs> the town purchased that. And then Island Pond Cemetery, um, the Underwood sold that to the town at some point. That's two separate cemeteries. And the Harwich Center sub Cemetery is the cemetery closer to the Congregational Church. That's correct. Uh, I think it's a terrific idea that you're putting maps together. Well, a lot of people ask me when they come how to find graves. and. <laughs> uh, the thought it should be to put that online also. Yeah, yeah, that is our intent, so that, that way when people come for Quickly. funerals and stuff, they can actually find their way without calling for directions. Thank you. Anyone else have a question or comment? If not, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. We now move to the uh, third of the presentations, and this is from the, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just request through the chair that people turn their phones off. We've heard multiple ringings, so can you at least silence them? I'm sorry, I was gonna do that in a second. Uh, we're going to uh, hear from our uh, Wastewater Implementation Advisory Committee. That's another phone. Yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Ted. Thank you. Uh, good evening. This isn't just our annual report. This is our final report. Uh, we've completed our work uh, at your request of 18 months ago, and um, it is uh, in your hands as a final uh, report, and we also have an executive summary. Uh, for those that are interested, there's 10 copies up here or so of the executive summary, and you're welcome to them. The report itself is um, online and can be uh, downloaded. It's very uh, long, so I didn't print out copies for everybody. Uh, so um, I first want to uh, commend our committee. It really was a terrific committee. In the past 18 months, they've met more than 30 times, and each session was filled with hard work done in a good spirit. This does not include the hundreds of hours put in by each researching dozens of studies, talking to experts and residents, and likely reading thousands of pages. They challenged assumptions, sought new questions, met with many stakeholders, and ultimately found solutions. I would like to thank them for working so hard to make Harwich a better place. Some of them are in the room tonight. Uh, Danette Gonzalez, representing the Water Quality Task Force. Uh, Chris Harlow, representing the Capital Outlay Committee. Alan Thompson, representing the uh, Harwich Water Department. Noreen Donahue is the liaison from the Finance Committee and Larry Ballantyne was the liaison from the Board of Selectmen. 
In addition, uh, we have two members who are not here this evening. Uh, Hugh Drummond, uh, who was representing the Harwich Taxpayers Association, is ill. And Bob Steiner, who is our clerk, uh, is on holiday, I guess, in Florida. Um, we also had three members early on that had to retire early. I want to recognize uh, Val Peter was representing the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, Frank Sampson, who had led the discussion for several years on wastewater, uh, was on the committee early. And Pete Watson, who was replaced by Chris Harlow, representing the Capital Outlay Committee. The town of Harwich faces an important challenge that's being undertaken across our planet. That is the challenge to keep our water, our estuaries, and our bays clean and healthy. We're very fortunate in Harwich that our drinking water is in excellent condition, deep and clean. <coughs> our water department has done an outstanding job maintaining its condition, and it's incumbent on the town to continue to protect our drinking water and provide outstanding stewardship through wise policy and regulatory decisions. Our estuaries and bays are another matter. Harwich consists of five watersheds. These watersheds are Herring River, Pleasant Bay, Allen Harbor, Witchmere Harbor, and Sacquatucket Harbor. As these watersheds drain into our estuaries, bays, and harbors, we need to control what drains into them to ensure the full estuary system remains healthy. Today, due to the drain from traditional Title V septic systems, there is too much nitrogen getting into the watersheds, which in turn brings too many nutrients into our bays and harbors. These nutrients cause growth that disturbs the balance for healthy embayment systems. The state of Massachusetts has determined a daily threshold for the amount of nitrogen that can safely be drained into watersheds, watersheds called total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs, which we have exceeded in all of our watersheds. The problem is serious now and will only get worse as we continue to drain our waste through the Title V septic systems. For swimmers, boaters, lovers of natural beauty, and those who appreciate the importance of balance in nature, this is a matter to be taken very seriously. After much study of several alternatives, it has been determined that a central sewer system that captures the necessary waste to return our watersheds to a proper balance is the best solution. That study is explained in the draft Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, which was completed last spring and is being reviewed by the state's Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act and the Department of Environmental Protection and the Cape Cod Commission. That was undertaken uh, through the Water Quality Task Force uh, Chairman Peter DeBacher who is here in the front of the room, and the consultant on this, Dave Young, is sitting beside him from CDM Smith, um, who was the author of this uh, tremendous piece. You've seen it, it's about four inches thick, and Heinz acted as a staff for them. Um, understanding the problem and the solution may not be enough to implement the solution. The sewering plan is projected to cost between $180 and $230 million over the next 40 years. This is going to require the entire Harwich community to come together to fully understand the problem and the solution, and in the end, manage the funding needed to implement the project. This leads us to a new challenge, a public relations challenge. We, we believe the final CWMP, including this report, needs to be accompanied by a successful public outreach strategy to all Harwich voters, including those less engaged today. The key to townwide support is complete transparency in a strategic public outreach program. Part of this strategy should be to bring the CWMP before town meeting to be approved by the voting public. It is good that the Cape Cod Commission has reached out to Harwich and offered the resources and funding to help with the outreach program. It requires strong leadership and a detailed plan to make certain that all of Harwich becomes informed and can make an educated choice going forward. The Commission will need Harwich leaders to help guide them even as we use their resources and funding. The relationship with the Commission is especially important as they are working towards a regional wastewater solution for the entire Cape, and Harwich is already acting on a regional solution by using the Chatham Treatment Plant for the Pleasant Bay watershed, and the Herring River plant can likely be regionalized with parts of Dennis. The county may also be very instrumental in securing future grants as low interest loads to help fund the project. As part of the public outreach and in recognition of the fact that our young people today will be the decision makers for most of this project, I think in 40 years most of us won't be around, but the high school kids will be, I hope. We'd like to recommend that a new prize be created in Dr. Stanley Cocutt's name to be awarded to a Monomoy or Tech Public High School student each year of $1,000. This prize to be called the Dr. Stanley Cocutt Health and Science Award. 
Uh, in the Water Quality Task Force meetings, uh, those who are on that board will know that Stan constantly talked about the need to educate high school kids uh, about this problem and other problems, I'm sure, to come. So what was our charge? Our charge was uh, three items. Uh, it's restated, by the way, in our uh, plan uh, in Appendix 1 in more detail. But the first was to establish a cost allocation policy for presentation at town meeting. The second was to explore funding sources. And the third was to develop organizational management structure for the wastewater system. So first, I'd like to share with you the challenge of financial planning for 60 years. The CWMP calls for eight phases over a 40-year period to complete all the capital requirements. If bonding is required in the final phase, then it will take an additional 20 years to pay off, hence the 60 years. On the cost side, each phase anticipates a specific cost associated with the work that needs to be done during that phase. The cost for each of these phases is subject to change at any time as the results of each phase is measured, nature reacts to what has taken place, and we become more familiar with all the variables that will impact the costs. This type of management is appropriately named adaptive management. So it is difficult to have accurate projections over such long period of time with so many variables that can affect costs. By working in five to seven year phases, adjustments can be made regularly. On the revenue side, it is equally challenging to predict more than seven to 10 years in advance. Having said that, we decided to look at all 60 years of revenue and costs based on what we know today. We understand that revenues are as subject to change as costs, such as changes in population base, construction pace, water use rates, and so on. Although our modeling does show all 60 years, we, we anticipate the first 10 to 15 years as being the most accurate. It will be the responsibility of the town's financial leadership to track this each year and make the adjustments necessary to reforecast on an ongoing basis. There are additional costs and revenues that are not in the plan um, that are important to note. Um, as with most municipal finance projections, the CWMP is using today's dollar values uh, through the entire project and does not adjust for cost of living increases or inflationary projections. We've continued that practice and have no, not anticipated any additional such costs. Regarding additional revenues, we have fixed our fees and charges on today's population base. While we anticipate more than 30 single family homes being built each year, we do not actually scale our revenues to show population increases from year to year in some of the impact fees and or taxes. We also have not included the betterment fees for subdivisions greater than five homes, apartments in a village center, commercial complexes, et cetera, whose betterment fee would be based on the costs of the innovative alternative septic systems they would otherwise have to install by Board of Health regulations. Our plan includes many sources of revenue, which I'll go through in a moment, that need to be protected so they are only used for funding the capital costs of the wastewater project. Together, all of these fees and taxes will pay for all the capital costs. It's imperative that a new dedicated wastewater fund is created to protect these funds. Ultimately, our recommendations will involve future decisions by various regulatory bodies, including the possible need to consider filing legislation to amend the town charter. We have reviewed all of our recommendations with the relevant town staff for input into the final draft of this report, including the town administrator, the town accountant, the town assessor, the town health director, the town planner, the natural resources officer, as well as CDM Smith, the consultant on the project, and the coordinator for the Pleasant Bay Alliance the superintendent of the town water department, the director of highways and maintenance, and the town engineer. Our report does not get involved in any of the specifics that each person, each staff person might need to undertake to meet all of these recommendations. We feel this direction is best given by the town administrator or the board of selectmen. Very quickly, I'll outline the CPWI, which is the comprehensive, uh, the, uh, the plan for wastewater implementation, the large document. Um, after the table of contents and introduction, the first section is the first 34 pages deal with the funding sources and the cost allocation recommendations. Section two is the next three pages, and that's the revenue and cost flow chart, and in many cases, it's really the guts of this entire uh, plan. Section three is dealing with the management structure, uh, and section four, uh, the next two pages are dealing with the public outreach concerns. And finally, section five is the executive summary uh, of the entire uh, document. 
Uh, following that is a interesting thing that uh, folks might like to glance at no matter what documents you're reading when it has to do with planning or wastewater issues, which is a definition of in glossary of terms. It's more than six pages of acronyms and definitions that uh, Danette worked very hard to put together uh, so that you can read the CWMP and read the CPWI uh, a little more easily, hopefully. Um, and then there are five appendices that follow that uh, that include our charge as well as the eight phases of the CWMP. Uh, we've posted this on uh, the town website, the full plan as well as the, I, I should ask Jamie, did we post those, Jamie? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, the uh, full plan as well as the executive summary are in our section of the website, so you're welcome to uh, look at that. Um, in addition, we sent a copy of the full plan to a number of boards and committees before today so that they might be prepared if they wanted to uh, be here this evening. Uh, and at the same time when we sent this out, we offered our services to meet with them on a formal basis to address any questions that those various boards and committees might have. And that includes the Board of Assessors, the Board of Health, the Board of Water Commissioners, the Capital Outlay Committee, the Finance Committee, the Planning Board, and the Water Quality Task Force. So, getting into revenue and cost flows. On the cost side, the cost side is really covered by the CWMP. Um, our job on top of that was figuring out the revenue to cover all those costs. So the CWMP does an outstanding job outlining all the costs by phase associated with the project over those 40 years. In the back of the plan, if you refer to Appendix 4, you'll see a chart that shows all of those phases, what their years are, um, how much money is dedicated to each of those years, and what the money is to be used for. Uh, it's a pretty comprehensive chart that you can follow along as you read. It's important to also understand costs that are not part of our capital plan. These are the costs that are borne by the residential and commercial users of the sewer. The first are connection costs. That, that is hooking up to the sewer, a one-time charge. These costs are wide-ranging depending on distance to the sewer, the topography of the land, and other complications. The CWMP estimates that cost to be an average of $4,424 per connection. The town may want to uh, assist residents in financing this cost, but is not included in our capital cost recovery model. The other cost that's not included are the operations and maintenance costs. These are monthly charges once the sewer is in place that are charged back to the users. These costs are estimated at $3 million per year when everything is built and all buildings are connected. Until then, the cost will vary as more homes are using the sewer and construction, construction costs continue. Uh, we took a, a long look at the CWMP to see about any recommendations on the cost side before we got to the revenue side, and we had a few. Uh, the first is the contingency factor. Right now, the contingency factor in the CWMP is 25%, and we felt that uh, there are ample examples of other projects that have come in well under that, and that 20% should be sufficient. In addition, due to the enormous cost for wastewater solutions on the planet, technology advancements may be made over the next 40 years to help control those costs, which we valued at an additional 5% discount on the contingency factors. Having said that, in all of our models, we're using the range of costs given in the CWMP of 180 to 230 million. So if there are any savings on those contingencies, it'll only be to our advantage. Uh, commercial flow calculations in East Harwich. It's reasonable to believe that commercial uses may change with a sewer in place, allowing for businesses such as restaurants, hotels, et cetera, which are not permitted today. Therefore, using historic, the historic number of 35 gallons per day per 1,000 square feet is too low, and the calculation should be based on a minimum of 95 gallons per day per 1,000 square feet, which is still below the average commercial flow in Harwich today. We are pleased to note that David Spitz, our town planner, agreed that these flow calculations need to be reconsidered in his staff notes to our committee. Land use management. The planning department reports that if the town were to build all residential and commercial development as allowed under today's zoning, we could build 2,233 dwelling units, residences, uh, we've already built a little under 11,000, and some 2 million more square feet of commercial space. We've built almost 3 million. It is understood that the sewer may allow for new development opportunities, especially in higher density areas like village centers throughout the town, but the town must still be mindful to offset these increases in development 
so as to maintain the town's character and natural resources while controlling infrastructure costs. The CWMP anticipates all of that development and also allows for an additional 250 dwelling units and 500,000 square feet of commercial space in East Harwich. And it allows for an additional 25% more wastewater flow from commercial development along the Route, one, the Route 28 corridor in Harwichport. Our committee recommends that the town should initiate an effort through the planning board to rezone Harwich that will lead to no net increase in development, but will create greater densities and more continuous open space with the same development allowed under current zoning. In other words, still over 2,200 uh, dwelling units, and uh, David's quite uncertain about all the commercial space that's really available there, so whatever that number ends up being. We also recommend that these more densely populated areas allow for more affordable and workforce housing options than is currently available in Harwich. We would also recommend removing any allowance for growth beyond those 2,233 residences and hundreds of thousands of commercial square feet already allowed under current zoning, including Harwichport and East Harwich. Once again, we are pleased to note that Mr. Spitz has agreed that the extra development on the Route 28 corridor in Harwichport may not be appropriate. And finally, on the CWMP is the Pleasant Bay Recharge Area. We're concerned that the Cape Cod Commission's opinion has not been sought on the matter of whether or not a wastewater recharge area can be permitted in the location under consideration in Pleasant Bay. As this is part of the Six Ponds District and therefore subject to DCPC regulations, their permission should be ensured before any land purchase takes place. We strongly believe in the economic and cultural vitality of Harwich. We also believe that good growth is not simply adding to the population, it is adding to the community. After all, simply adding people for the tax revenue also adds a burden that is likely greater than the tax revenues, such as costs for schools, police, fire, and other town services. It is a net loss proposition unless the growth we encourage benefits the community in other ways, especially economically. This responsible growth will bring much needed vibrancy to the community and more affordable and workforce housing options for current future residents. The ability to build over 2,000 new residents and hundreds of thousands of square feet of commercial space is more than enough when coupled with responsible townwide policies and regulations to create exciting growth. Growth beyond that is costly, irresponsible, and necessary, and a no growth policy is a flawed policy. In addition, it is fully understood in the CWMP that the purpose for installing a wastewater system is to solve the excess nutrient problem and ensure healthy harbors and embayments. The purpose is not to enable additional development beyond the significant development allowed under current zoning in Title V septic today. Every single additional user of wastewater is causing a greater problem and a larger expense. On the revenue side, I'll run through the recommendations on how we might recover these costs over the 60-year period. First of all, we felt it was very important in any revenue model to have multiple sources of revenue so that we have more opportunities to adjust to the economic times and are not dependent on only one source of revenue. So regarding grants and loans, the report shows that we are not anticipating any funding from outside sources such as federal and state grants at this time. However, we do believe that these sources of funding are likely to become available during the 40-year project and the town should remain vigilant and apply for these grants. A very good example of that is the announcement just made on Muddy Creek. Um, this was a grant that was not for wastewater purposes, it was for habitat and environmental purposes. Um, but our very first phase, which had a significant amount of money from Harwich to go to the Muddy Creek uh, project on our capital um, expenses is no longer going to be required. So all of our predictions are already having to be adjusted in our first day being done. Special low interest loans such as the state's clean water state revolving fund are available in very small quantities and their future is uncertain. So we did not include any special low interest loans in our model. On pages 36 to 38 of the report, you'll find the funding matrix. Uh, the funding matrix outlines our sources of revenue and their percentage impact on the total costs. So for example, we have betterments. Every residence and business on the sewer will be assessed a betterment fee equal to what they will have saved by not being on Title V. You'll see on page 74 our equation for how we determine what that betterment fee is for a single family home with a Title V septic system as being $7,000. Uh, 
This betterment fee on, the betterment fee on subdivisions greater than five homes, apartments in a village center, commercial complexes, et cetera, will require a similar calculation based on the innovative alternative system that will be replaced or not need to be built for those large parcels. And that can be determined by the Board of Health once they know exactly what those uh, IA systems might be required. But as I mentioned earlier, that's one of the sources of revenue that we've not included in our revenue stream. So that would be additional revenue. Then we have a series of impact fees. And the impact fees uh, begin with um, new construction. Uh, if you look at page 26 of your report, you'll see a recap of five years history in Harwich of what the pace of construction has been. It's roughly 31, I believe, houses that are uh, built in each year on average, uh, and how many additions are done and so on. And uh, we have a chart that you'll see there that shows what we're recommending for the fee associated with that new, new construction costs. So that uh, the fee for a single family home who averages, by the way, three bedrooms according to the Board of Health is an $18,000 fee. If you're doing an addition to your home uh, and you add a bedroom, it's $6,000 per bedroom. This does not matter if you're in the sewer district or not. This is all construction in town. Um, similarly, on the commercial side, if you are building a lodging establishment, uh, senior living, motel, hotels, et cetera, it would be $3,000 per bedroom, and all other commercial development would just be $3,000 per bathroom. We use bedrooms, by the way, uh, the Board of Health does as well, to determine the actual uh, use of water um, as opposed to numbers of bathrooms, which might sound more logical, but it's really not, because it's people that are sleeping there that use the facilities. Then we're also proposing, oh, and by the way, uh, the new construction, uh, well, first of all, the betterments uh, will pick up 22 to 30 percent of all of our capital costs. The new construction will pick up another 20 to 29 percent. By the way, the range is based on the range of the CWMP of 180 to 230 million. That's why the range in percentage. Then we have an all parcel flat fee. This is a fee that would be charged for all parcels in town, which is uh, 4,700 and something, um, uh, an annual $250 fee that would last for 10 years only. And that would pick up 12 to 16 percent more of our costs. And then a water bill surcharge. This would be a 35 percent supplement on all water bills, including commercial and tax exempt properties. And this would cover 17 to 23 percent of all of our costs. And then we have a couple of uh, taxes we're recommending that are not basically funded by ourselves, their own, our own residents. And one is an occupancy tax on hotel rooms. Uh, currently, the hotel occupancy tax is 9.7%. Uh, we're recommending raising that to 11.7%, which would increase the town's share from 2% to 4% that would actually be received into this fund. The additional 2% would go to the uh, capital cost for wastewater. That's a small amount that only represents 4 to 6% of the total capital costs, but it's still an a important way to recognize that we have visitors that are also contributing to the problem that we have with nitrogen loading. And similarly, on the meals tax, even though this only picks up about 2% of our total costs, uh, we're recommending increasing it from 6.25% to 7%. So if all those total fees and assessments actually come to pass, which, as I mentioned earlier, it's very hard to predict this over 60 years. Um, it would cover $185 million of revenue without ever touching the general property taxes. So if our costs stay as low as $180 million, it would be fully covered. If our costs are greater, say 230, million, we would cover about 80% of those costs. The idea here is that after all these fees, assuming lots of changes are going to happen over the next 40 years, um, where these costs will not cover, these revenues will not cover the costs, then the property tax would kick in. And you'll see, start to see what the property tax impact would be. If you are to look at pages 57 to 59, this is the uh, most significant uh, chart that we have. This shows all of the uh, costs by bond and all of the various forms of revenue on an annual basis. So every single year, you can see what we're paying out in principal and interest to pay off a bond, and you can see what we're receiving in all of our revenues, and you'll see a net 
in our fund, whether we have a positive net or negative net, and then that carries forward from year to year. Um, right now, uh, that chart shows that for 30 years, we remain uh, in the black, positive, all from the fees and services, and we're not needing property taxes until 30 years have passed. Um, and uh, those property taxes vary depending on those particular years, and you can see that in the chart as well. At some point, you may want to have a more detailed uh, discussion on this, and we'll be happy to participate. As you read this chart, here's some assumptions for you to understand, that on the bonding side, we've assumed that each phase will be bonded beginning in the first year of the phase. Each bond will be for 20 years at 3% interest. And due to a bond beginning before the prior one is completed, because the phases are every five to seven years and the bonds are 20 years, we actually, for much of this time, have four bonds at a time overlapping, which causes, you can imagine, a great deal of expense. You may choose not to do some bonding. If the revenues are actually as strong as we're predicting, um, you can save an awful lot on interest by not going through the bonding process. On the revenue side, uh, we show the betterments at $7,000 I mentioned to you on uh, residential development, um, the residential uh, hookups, uh, and we are, we are projecting that most people will want to fund that over a 20-year period at a 5% interest. So it shows it not at a one-time revenue, but stretched over those 20 years. And as I mentioned, the all-parcel flat fee ends after 10 years. Uh, our final um, charge was to deal with the question of management structure. Uh, since the CWMP is still in its review stages and then should receive significant public outreach, including adoption by town meeting, we are still a long ways from approval for the project. As the complexion of the project can change so much during the startup years, we recommend that the town maintain as much flexibility as possible. Rather than set a precedent by having a structured and staffed department, we recommend that we outsource this management responsibility and contract with an individual or firm to fill the role for at least the first several years of the program and likely through 2018, when we will still have so few users on the system and when construction begins on the Herring River treatment plant in the Herring River watershed. Certainly, Harwich will have its consulting firm, CDM Smith, involved, who will be able to work well with this project manager. We do not want a highly paid town employee, town employed manager sitting idle during lag times. But having a wholly qualified party representing Harwich's interests alone would be extremely desirable. We do not believe this function can be accomplished by a combination of committees working with CDM, as that method would seem to have some inherent risks in terms of the committee members' qualifications, as well as the responsibility and clear authority to deal with the public, the regulatory agencies, and the construction issues. It would seem more prudent, despite the cost of the position, to have a committee in place to support the project manager as well as to be available for continuing public education, outreach, and advice as the project advances. All of these, uh, these statements, if you will, that I'm saying here as a summary have a great deal of uh, background that are in the full report. So if you want to understand what the water department thought about a possible uh, management system, that's in the report. If you want to know what the highways and departments thought, that's in the report, rather than my going through all of it. So just in conclusion, uh, this cost recovery report represents a unique way of considering how to finance the town's most expensive single project in its history. In our deliberations, we considered as many opposing views as possible so that we could draft something that might address each issue. Those on the sewer versus those remaining on Title V. Large property owners versus small and single lot property owners. Wealthy residents versus moderate and disadvantaged residents. Tax paying properties versus tax exempt properties. Properties on town water versus properties on private wells. Large users of town water versus small users of town water. Residential development versus commercial development. Residents versus visitors. Property already developed versus property to be developed in the future. Economic development versus no growth advocates. Advocates for open space versus advocates for maximum development. Properties in dense areas versus remote properties outside town centers properties in our watershed versus properties outside our watersheds, and so on. In the end, as in the beginning, we recognize that every one of these groups is responsible for the excess nitrogen or future nitrogen draining into our watersheds, 
and every one of these groups will benefit by having healthier estuary systems with the future of our harbors and bays looking brighter. This assortment of fees and taxes involves all of those above. The prospect of having to fund a project of this magnitude can seem overwhelming and can cause anger, resentment, and divisiveness in a small community like Harwich. We know our neighbors well. We know the people with whom we do business. We know our elected officials and appointed officials, and we all want to be treated fairly. <clears throat> when everyone understands the reason for the project and understands that no one is exempt from paying some share of the expenses, then perhaps we can all agree on a solution such as proposed in this document. Thank you for allowing me the honor of chairing this outstanding committee. Thank you for your report. Uh, any, uh, yeah, a couple of comments. Uh, I certainly want to express my appreciation, Ted, for you chairing the committee and for the committee. Uh, I know I, I didn't sit through all of them. Uh, in fact, a few of them I, I cheated and left early. But uh, That doesn't even count when you fell asleep. <laughs> point, point taken. Just kidding. <laughs> but they did a lot of work. I also uh, commend them in, uh, for uh, sticking their neck out and making concrete recommendations. I think that uh, someone has to do that so we can react to it. Uh, and uh, and, I re and as, as Ted knows, I disagree with some of the recommendations going forward as you've talked. I think for us as a Board of Selectmen, uh, these recommendations are a great discussion point for us to do what's, what's our job now is, is uh, take on the policy issues uh, that are part of those recommendations. Uh, because if, if you look at the list, uh, the allocation, for instance, of uh, fee structures are, are certainly a, a policy decision for us. Uh, you know, the, uh, the significant portion of that coming from impact fees in some, in some sense, will be uh, seen as a, uh, a fighting growth as they go against uh, new construction, for instance. And uh, that does spread it around. You, know, you made a good point, but that's a, a discussion that, that we should have. Uh, the land use policy is, is critical for us it's, uh, in various forms. We've talked, uh, and they talked extensively about that. Uh, but that also is a policy discussion for us for the uh, uh, planning board for the town as a whole. Uh, we've, we've beat forever. Uh, Angela, you keep bringing it up, uh, build out scenarios. Uh, we also have inherited in that uh, the statement that this plan is to reduce nitrogen. That's absolutely true. I would argue it's also to address uh, within that framework, as you have, Ted, so I'm not uh, going uh, against what you've said, uh, but address uh, affordable housing and uh, economic development. And we have some good tools in the basic uh, smart growth parameters that are set out by the state and that you've uh, basically referred to in, in, in density growth. Uh, we also have to address as, uh, as a policy is uh, the affordability of this, of this entire plan, which this committee uh, grappled with forever, and that's part of the reason for the complex list of fees, is how do we... Uh, allow a, uh, a vibrant uh, community with all the income levels. And that, again, I think is a policy decision. Uh, there are several of those. And uh, tonight's not tonight to go through those. My proposal, Mr. Chair, is that, uh, that we uh, add this, uh, the documents are on the website now, but we uh, add to that website a, uh, a place where people can uh, email us uh, their comments, uh, so it can be done on the internet. We uh, set up uh, at the office to take phone calls on comments on this. I would suggest that, that uh, we allow that a 30 or 60 day uh, time frame. Uh, and then we hold a, uh, at least one public uh, meeting on this to present this again and start getting the, uh, as much information we can on I think is our policy decisions on this recommendation. Uh, so we can move forward. We're obligated uh, to complete this uh, recommendation for the CWMP uh, early part of next year. And so we can't wait forever and we're into the season. But we need to have a process now to take this, this good work and these recommendations as a starting point and then do our uh, policy discussions, I believe. So uh, that's my recommendation is to continue this. 
through a uh, broad uh, advertisement uh, comments and then uh, discussions both here because ultimately we need to have this public discussion in a town meeting and so we need to move in that direction um, just to follow up on that um, I may not have stressed enough in here uh, our concerns that the st strategic public outreach plan be put together um, that's in the hands right now of the water quality task force and they're working with the Cape Cod Commission on it, as I mentioned but boy before as part of the public outreach that you're talking about there's a lot of stuff that can be done between now and then to get the message out as much as possible so people understand the various ways that this can be funded and they can come armed with good information and be well educated and be able to contribute to the conversation. Uh, I fully agree and that's one of the dilemmas, uh, dilemmas. Uh, well yeah dilemmas we have I think is that uh, the committee came up and discussed actually more than they presented various options for fees. Sure. You know <clears throat> a very creative discussion in fact the uh, the county and the collaborative uh, Cape Cod Commission, uh, I don't want to overstate this, but I will, they stole a lot of the, uh, the ideas that came from this committee as a starting point. And in some ways that becomes a brainstorming session of how can you generate fees across the county. Uh, you know, I mean, I've heard ideas, that, and you, people are going to hate this, but <laughs> ideas of a, a bridge toll. You know, and you can go through item after item. We're all trying to get to the same spot, which gives us a little bit of difficulty when we start talking this aspect of the cost is that we're not there yet. People are throwing out ideas as we, as we continue. But we need to come up with a policy is, uh, is to take what this is in an overall strategy. But I take it as a good point, Ted. Just, just, oh, I'm sorry, Peter. Okay. No, it's okay. Thanks, Ted and the committee. I mean, there's a lot of information here. Quite frankly, it's a little bit difficult to digest. Just you know, sure. with you, you basically you know giving a verbiage, be nice if we um, you know at some point on the three basic topics. I think they each deserve an evening of, of discussion, if you will, um, and some pie charts maybe and whatnot on the on the financial part of it. But you know what strikes you here is you know if we had 12,000 roughly residents, you're, you're talking 15 to 20 thousand dollars a piece, you know, to get this thing funded. I think is a you know sort of just a, a number now granted it's taken over you know 40 or 60 years but it's a lot of money it's a lot of money and I think that um, we're gonna have to start getting into this and we need to get into it um, but I do appreciate the fact that you threw it out there you know um, everybody can talk about well I think we got to do this do that you basically from what I can see looked at every source you could possibly imagine and said let's take a shot at it and let's share this somehow whether it's whether you can have a discussion on whether it's equitable or not, but but you took the shot and said it's got to be funded a number of different ways, basically. And uh, I, I applaud you for doing that. So, you know, they're throwing the gauntlet down to us, and I think it's it's going to be our job in the next couple of months to you know start yakking about it. I'd also like to say it's a readable report. Uh, yeah. So many reports get written, and you have no idea what they're saying. But this one is it's clear and it's it's not filled with a lot of uh, verbiage so it's really it's it's well done thank you I, th I think the uh, we haven't covered a couple of things that are very important in the conversation today or in the report one is basically what you're saying is we're all responsible for the sewer treatment plant and whatnot that just because you don't have uh, a sewer or you're in your own home that doesn't mean you're not part of the part of the payment uh, group because you're part of the problem and I think it's important to, to establish that we are all together as part of the problem as, as you've done here uh, then you've listed I think it was a gazillion I, I counted ways of, of, of generating funds uh, some of which I've never heard of before but some were uh, <laughs> It, it doesn't matter because what you're saying is we've got to come up with a, a pile of sources of funds that make sense. It may work out that taxes are better than uh, fees because taxes tend to be deductible from ta your taxes. And that has to be taken into consideration. But at least we know everybody's responsible. There needs to be multiple ways of getting the funds and we should start soon to do this. 
because if we can start sooner uh, and start putting the funds away in a revolving fund or, or whatever mechanism it, there is, we might be going the right direction and hold down taxes and fees. So I, I think it's a, a good general direction. We could quibble for 12 days on the individual taxes, and I think we need to have a discussion on them and move down the line. I don't know where we'll come out, but I think uh, Larry's absolutely right. We need to have a, a, a discussion. We're more than happy to um, to help with that. I, um, I took that for granted, Ted, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm speaking for myself for the moment because we had our final meeting tonight and read the minutes of our final meeting. Um, there is uh, one thing I want to mention, which is that uh, we've created, a, I think, a really valuable tool for you guys and Dave Ryan uh, to be able to, uh, in a spreadsheet, be able to move any of these fees you want to and see the impact on your total, including what's going to fall to property taxes. So we, we left property taxes as the final bastion, if you will. One is that we didn't want to have to keep dealing with the Prop 2.5, and, and you're going to need it for lots of other things coming up, like maintenance of all your buildings and things like that down the road. So if we could keep it off the property taxes, that was our thinking there. But you're absolutely right. That is the one place that's tax-free. Uh, tax so um, this tool uh, will allow you to uh, ignore some of our assumptions and use your own assumptions. You can uh, plug in, uh, you can take a, that annual fee, uh, all parcel fee, and double it, and suddenly you've got $25 million more if you want it. You can reduce it, all that stuff, and all you have to do is change a single number, and everything changes. The number, which you, when you look at it, to address Peter's question, if there are no fees and no betterments, it's all on property taxes. It's roughly $26,000, including all the bonding interests and all that stuff that falls over the 60-year period. So it's a lot of money, you're right. And that's why we were trying to get a little more creative with that. Okay. Ed? Philosophically, one of, one of the issues I think was highlighted by something Peter said, the issue of if you take 12,000 people and divide the cost, it comes out to 15,000. But in fact, what we are building is not a system for 12,000 people. We're building a system that can take the flow of some 30,000 people, which is our peak population during the summer. And, and in terms of uh, fees tend to be paid to a greater extent by those of us who live here year-round, as opposed to property taxes, which are borne by property owners uh, equally uh, throughout the year, and uh, um, so that's uh, that. I think will probably be a discussion that we will have to have. Sure, and we know that an, an awful lot of um, the high property tax payers don't use very much water because they're not here all that much, and yet they would be hit very high if it was just on property taxes. So that was part of that discussion of wealthy versus less wealthy, and so on. But we had all of those. We'd be happy to share all those thoughts with you. Okay, Linda. I really appreciate the uh, comments in here about having a somehow corralling whatever these fees and money are, whatever that is, corralling it into a fund so it doesn't disappear. And if you start collecting it, it's sitting there waiting to be paid out for these projects. And I think that was a very, it, it's a point that can be missed. And I'm well, really glad that you have it in here because that, that's kind of an important point. Yeah, I appreciate that because we also have times during this flow that you'll see there's a substantial fund that's being built up early on that will look really attractive, you know, for other things that have to be paid for. So that was one of the primary reasons. No rating. Well, I think I'd like to thank you very much. And are you, you're serious about it. this is it, right? So we should thank you and your committee for all the work you've done. We, we don't have another meeting scheduled to answer that question okay. until you might direct yeah. us. All right. So you will plan on how we're going to go I'll forward. Put, I'll put something together on that. And uh, even though you disbanded, I would, uh, I'll take you up on your offer to uh, help us in the public Great. presentation. And for those of you that would like a copy of the executive summary, they're up on the front table there. They're very readable. One, Thank you. If I could, one question. Where on the town's website can they find the full report? Under the committee's section, our committee is close to the bottom where it says Wastewater Implementation Advisory Committee. In there, well, we have a section that are for posted documents. We have about five documents that we've been posting you know, periodically as we've done certain work. 
and it's in that section. I, I, uh, I would like to, Bob, if it's okay, is to check with uh, Foster and Jill to see if we can uh, move that to a more prominent place uh, also for the next month or so, and uh, see if we can. Excuse me, just and to see if there's a mechanism that we can get uh, comments oh, yeah. mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, follow through that mechanism, so it's easy for people to uh, make a statement. You can also put it in multiple locations, like at the Water Quality Task Force um, place and the Planning Board, wherever else you want to do it, Board of Health, et cetera. It's yeah. easy enough to do that. Right. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I think we need to look at your committee page because I, while you were talking, <coughs> I was calling it up trying to find. And the only public document that comes up is the 2012 WIAC Annual Town Report. Well, when I looked at it earlier today, they were all there. So yeah, I sure. think I've looked at it and it's there. I, I just so I'll, I'm calling it, it up be, now. I'd, it's just a, it's the iPod. It could be, be your fingers, Ed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> We're now going to move on to old business. And first subject is the Allen Harbor Access Grant. Oh. Bob, would you like to start this, please? Uh, Harbor Master is here this evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sorry, I didn't see him. Sorry, John, I didn't see you. To add, um, to add some more information as is a representative from Allen Harbor. Uh, <laughs> in the memo dated uh, October 24 to the board, I outlined the conversations that Mr. Rendon and I have had and the engineering report. Uh, and maybe, John, if you want to expand on that at all, if you had a microphone, which I think is on the floor. Uh, while they're setting but, up, Red Sox are up one. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but in, in summary, it would seem that the so requirements of having an uh, Im impervious uh, parking lot not only increase the cost, but also raise the height of the parking lot, making it basically unusable by others. So uh, do you want to give any yes, more sir. details? That's all right, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, John Rendon, Harbor Master. Um, I, I think you have in your packet uh, what uh, Coastal Engineering came up with as far as the, the additional estimated cost that it would uh, uh, entail if they went with a traditional uh, drainage system, but I think more importantly what um, it would do to the lot itself. Um, I didn't see the map on that, John. Can you visual? I have a difficulty visualizing that. Is it because of drainage? You have to raise the the level nearest the water so it doesn't go into the water, or what's? Well, I, I mean, right now the way that it, it's being designed is with the pervious system is they're they're going to elevate the parking lot, and they're going to elevate it so it all drains towards the middle of the parking lot where this pervious system is in place. And the level that they're raising it is really not that significant. I think it was five inches, uh, you know, at the at the edge, and over a period of time, they they grade it so that it's really doesn't have an impact. Yeah. By doing the traditional drainage system, it's significant. It's two and a half feet. And can you can you do the same you, motions and where that's draining to? I I just have I was having know, a hard I don't time have visualizing the plans yet. Uh, they haven't. They didn't provide us the actual engineering plan of the traditional system. This was kind of, they knew we were waiting for mm. their assessment. I got that email that gave that estimated cost and I haven't actually seen the engineering design of the, of the traditional system. This is just coming from their assessment. So uh, I don't have it yet. They're also talking in their, in their comments about having to increase the height of the bulkheads by two and a half feet. Mm -hmm. That's right. uh, it, it causes for some reason a reduction in the ability to capture storm water runoff at the boat ramp. Yeah, I read that. I was just having a hard time visualizing why, why the difference. If it's still going to some drainage location, why it was higher. Uh, like, you know, it just maybe, uh, I'm probably, I'm, I'm sure it's very simple. I'm just missing it. But. I think that, if I may, I think the difference is with the, um, the pervious pavement that trying to divert the water to a much larger area. Yeah. 
so you don't need to create as much flow with the pavement you'd be trying to direct all the water okay. to a single row of storm drains so, so, have to, mm -hmm. so you have to get that water going a lot faster mm -hmm. okay so like that's why the edges of the whole thing would have to be up higher to begin with okay Whereas, hmm. okay thank, thank you thank you <laughs> that helps So, so the bottom line is, when I read here, um, I assume Allen Harbor is okay with finding another location for, for the boat storage. The uh, recommendation is, I believe, to stick with the uh, state reimbursement at the 61% right. or whatever. That's, that's my recommendation and, and the harbor and master. Forward, yes, sir. And you guys are all on board with that, I trust. I'll let, I'll let Craig speak for himself, but I, I think we both agree that going the traditional route is not the right way to go both because of cost and it makes that lot not usable it, in the current state and i won't speak for you but so from my perspective the only option really that we have is the pervious concrete system well Let there's me. also the issue here of having to put up a you know fencing with the two and a half feet and how do you get the boats over the fence yeah. and yeah. i can't imagine how hmm. difficult that one would just be. just one other question uh, if we go with this route have you made arrangements to provide another area for storage of their boats? Well, as I've said in the past, I think we can entertain Sacquatucket Harbor as an option. Okay. Whether, we, you, whether they want to go that route or not. That's or fine. Not. They don't have to go that route. It's just as long as they have a route. I'm sorry, Ed, I couldn't see you. Well, in, in addition to getting the boats over the... the the, the higher level is, it sort of wreaks havoc on our recently installed handicapped accessible dock. <laughs> right. <laughs> it add an extra mm -hmm. uh, 20, uh, 30 feet onto the length of the mm -hmm. runway uh, to take up for the, you know. So um, with that, I move, uh, make a motion that we move ahead with, um, uh, I, I see, Somebody yeah. getting nervous? <laughs> yes. would like to want to make a few points if I could. Sure. Um, we are in agreement. I can't argue that it would make any sense to go with the asphalt. It's just way too much work. Um, but there are a couple of points I'd like to raise. When we've looked at the option of storage on the pervious pavement or storage at Sacquatucket, um, there would be limiting factors in both areas to what we could do. Um, over the pervious pavement, we'd be restricted um, in a lot of ways, especially with discharge of any type of liquid through a variety of functions. Um, at Sacquatucket, being on asphalt, it may be not as restrictive, but it's also a mile and a half or whatever it is. So if you're back in the transportation costs, we started to think about are there is the parking lot, would it be all that bad on the pervious pavement? Um, and the things kind of cancel each other out. We, we would be still interested in renting the town lot with the pervious pavement strictly for storage and any activities that wouldn't go against the regulations as far as discharge into the pervious pavement. So that's, we're back to $68,000 differential you had asked previously if we'd be willing to front that and have it come out of the lease payments in some form um, while we're not in a position to front that 68,000 um, in large part due to the, the dredging expense that just came up we would be interested in continuing to rent the town parking lot at Allen Harbor even with the pervious service surface um, if somehow that 68,000 could be spread over the life of a longer lease, 10 years maybe as an example, and we'd be willing to contribute in that fashion. I know that the, the idea of the town coming up with the money initially has been sort of a, um, a sore spot. We don't have it either, to be honest with you, but the idea of, of having the access to the storage right next to us even with restrictions is better for us than having off-site storage um, that may be a little looser but factor in the travel and the hauling of the boats it's uh, it's still a hit 
for us. So we would, um, we would ask that the town still, if there's any way at all, consider the initial split with the state. Um, can, I'm sorry, not the initial, to proceed with the, the secondary proposal of the 50-50 split, uh, acknowledging it would increase the town's contribution. We'd be, we, we would consider helping out with that over the life, life of a longer lease, um, but we would still very much be interested in renting, being able to continue to rent the Allen Harbor lot, even with the pervious pavement. Okay. And you, would you raise your hand, Ed? Sorry. No? Yes? Uh, I, under, I understand your point, but I, I, to, do, to put that in place uh, would require a town meeting um, authorization um, and I'm not you know sure that we have until May and I'm not sure even we have uh, the 45 days uh, if we were inclined to call a special town meeting I I, believe that's I'd have to ask John on what his uh, sense is of uh, the state's interest in uh, us <laughs> making a decision <laughs> They're tired of hearing from you. Right? I mean, I obviously I keep putting them off, and we, we need to make a decision. Um, if if indeed we're looking to try to get this grant in place in time for being able to utilize state funds in the following year, you know, I mean, if we keep putting it off, it just one. I don't know if it risks our ability to get the grant, but it certainly delays it significantly in getting the work accomplished so Linda, I'm sorry. We, uh, we also did go over this last weekend in terms of uh, they've been looking for an answer now I guess we're a month behind giving right. them an answer at this point so uh, and I think we acknowledged as a board that we don't have the $68,000 to do this ourselves unless we have a town meeting and get town meeting to agree to spend the money and also get town meeting to agree for a 10-year lease I mean, all of those Correct. things, you know, and it was, does the board want to go to town meeting and ask for another $70,000 right. on this issue? So, I mean, right. can, I, can I ask? I don't I'm think sorry. the answers have changed for any of this. Have we uh, considered uh, reducing the price of the lease? If, if they were to go to Sacramento, yes. is that the question? I, I think we had that discussion, and mm -hmm. I, I certainly think that's something we should Look, consider it, it's a bid so the town would simply lower the minimum bid if you wanted to put a minimum at all but one we would assume that you would not be receiving the same amount that adjustment would have to be made in your estimated receipts yes but that's not the uh, major issue in front of us is it no but I just no. want to make the issue is I think how to get the point. money and do, do, uh, do you do you wish to go to town meeting assuming you will not get this grant you would go to town meeting in May you'd have to ask several questions as, as was outlined you'd have to have the 70,000 round numbers and you'd also have to have approval to go to a 10-year lease right. at I guess Sacramento or some or at Allen Harbor is, is there any uh, chance of getting the grant conditioned on this or you have to uh, no. I don't know how you operate on that I think we got no, that answered think, last week too which was right. no it had a big note no the, an, the answer is they've given us this well, grant with these conditions, right. they've made one modification. I to ask My understanding again. is they're not going to make any others. I think is what you said. I guess I remember the answer. <laughs> and, and I and I guess the, the other the other thing is uh, timing thing is not only do we have to get all those mm -hmm. approvals from town meeting, then we have to advertise and award the lease, et cetera, and sign et cetera, the documents et cetera. because mm -hmm. we can't really make the commitment until yeah. all of our documents are, are you know so we're, we're talking probably uh, if we voted tonight to do a special town meeting we're probably talking about not being able to make an agreement with the state until sometime late February or March mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sure we have that time and it, and it sounds like so they're going to get impatient I mean they've so been hilarious. terrific to work with but I mean it, there are other projects in line that right people are more ready Problem. to go what's our backup plan if we don't go this way yeah. if you if you do what 
if you don't, if you decide to ask for the 50 percent, right, then you That's follow it. the follow the outline as as so you started. You you it would then mm -hmm. we just go we, ahead with that. You you could, but I don't know that I would be recommending you sign the document because you do not have the sixty-eight thousand dollars to commit. That's my question. If we don't have the sixty-eight thousand, then I what's think our you next, should uh, sign yeah, the document. I've checked all the old articles and all that route with with Dave Ryan looking for those funds, and Dave was not able to right. come up with appropriate funds that we could yeah. use, which would still require a town meeting vote. But, uh, yeah, yes. but I mean, so I was, we, we, mm -hmm. we just don't have it. I would like a, I'd like a Mr. motion. Mr. Chair, yeah, I'd move that we, I'm not sure exactly what, what our step is, but to, uh, I, I guess, inform the Seaport Advisory Committee. Oh, is it, no, it's the, it's the... It's public access. It's the uh, Department of Fish and Game, and essentially we need to commit uh, to the percentages that we're willing to go forward with, and then they would develop, a they would draft a land okay. management agreement for your signature to move forward with the yeah. grant. I'd move that we uh, direct staff to inform the Division of Boating, uh, Boating and Waterways Public Access Division that we will be moving ahead with uh, a grant uh, with a 68 percent state participation. It would be 61.2 percent state and 38.8 yeah. uh, yeah. with us. Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Uh, you know, just a comment. You know, we, I think when we go to bid at town meeting over a lease on Sackwatucket, we all realize that we are have less a uh, less valuable uh, yeah. uh, yeah. A situation, and we'll just have to accept that. Or potentially less value. Yeah. yeah. There's no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I say that that was a, a hard decision to make? Yes. Yeah, it's a big hit for us. It's a hit for us, too. I, I think, as you know, we've gone through every source we could. Uh, you done? Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. I'd like to now move uh, to the uh, revised landfill solar project. Just in the case of making sure we don't get any easier as the evening <laughs> goes on. Um, well, last at the last meeting you asked me to make to find from town council what the uh, what the liabilities are or may be and then how we might accommodate those new liabilities in the new documents. We did receive a report from John Giorgio and Mr. Howland, or Holland, excuse me, regarding the lease, the new um, agreement and the new language. It seems as though there are three points in this document, in these documents, excuse me. The first is the security, and these, and I think, and we also talked about what answers there could be to these uh, problems. The first is the security at the site. It's my understanding that as part of the contract, uh, ACE uh, Solar will be putting in a um, some type of a fenced area, and we also have security at the site. So I believe that that is not an extensive liability, and we. While we don't like it, we can live with the language. In the second instance, it is the incompat incompatibility land use activities on a budding property. In looking at the property, and uh, Mr. Hughes nicely brought in the bigger map, and it does show, uh, which I had not seen but was brought to my attention today, that um, in all likelihood there is going to be nothing constructed that is going to significantly shade this area. Uh, those are the ones you gave to me, and Mr. Hughes has the big one. So I believe that is a manageable, um, a manageable problem that we can, we can handle. Thank you. We can uh, trust Peter to explain it to us on the big map. Thanks, Liz. 
The, um, just to complete the thought, the third issue is the physical adequacy to be able to handle the solar panels. And what that means is, according to the attorney and then dealing with, uh, talking with Link Cooper, is can we certify or be comfortable that the site where these things are going to be placed is stable? Because if it is not stable and the ground shifts, except for an act of God, uh, we may have some liability there. Uh, Mr. Hooper tells me that, yes, he has had some engineering done before when the site was closed, and he is confident that the, uh, the site is stable, uh, and there has also been no movement at that particular location since the site was closed. Now, the, and I won't get into the issue of what Dennis did or didn't do. In, in summary, the town of Dennis started from ground zero and was able to have all of the language negotiated. We, are, we and the other towns are not in that position. Um, it does seem, according to council, that if you determine not to sign this agreement, that we will not be able to secure the benefits, albeit that they've gone down a little bit, that we um, that uh, if we tried to do it on our own or did it in a later round, that council tells me that the, the benefits are the best we're going to get on this. Now, what I'd suggest is that know, knowing the liability that we sign the documents and have a cover letter outlining the issues that council has raised to CVEC, especially since the contract is kind of with CVEC as, a, as, as well as with ACE, outlining here are the issues we have, here are the clarifications that we uh, believe should be made, and then after we get going, maybe then try to negotiate something later. But at least be on record that we have issues and we have maybe a different opinion, or this is the interpretation we choose to make of the words that are in this document, which I guess cannot be changed. So bottom line is if we want the country if you want this to go forward, I think we need to sign the documents as presented. Okay. Any other comments? I make a motion we sign the uh, sign the documents. Yeah. I second it. We want to hear from Barry and Gang, but it seems like we don't have much don't of know, uh, but, but well, many options right now. And, and if I could, Mr. Chairman, I, I would say that uh, you know, on the topic of, of shading, if you will. Mm. Um, you know, basically, we look at Queen Anne Road as, oh, there's the north right there. See, we missed it. Oh, we ah, missed it. All right. Yeah. We, we couldn't Queen, find north on that. Obviously, you want to aim these solar panels south, and Queen Anne Road basically goes pretty much east-west. And uh, the orientation of the, the panels, obviously, is towards the south. And, and as mentioned in one of the documents, the town owns most of the land that's um, south, with the exception of one property, and you'd have to build something that was over, over 80 feet mm. in height, if I remember. Um, on the south side, if you will, to uh, have any effect at all on the uh, sun shining on mm -hmm. on the uh, solar panels, and you know we're restricted to a, a, a 30 foot height at the moment. And you know uh, anybody worried about cell towers? Those are typically up here on Queen Anne Road, which is north, which has no impact at all on this. Uh, Link, you know, has assured uh, uh, Bob that um, he has the documentation, so this is a stable site. And no, do we have some fencing here? But as you yes, say, sir. the uh, contractor in intends to uh, supply, uh, supply uh, fencing and security associated with the site. So, the, of course, there are risks. They don't totally go away. Right. But I think there are reasonable risks and risks we need to take. Uh, I want to recognize the fact that and remind everybody that that the revenue from this is what's going into our negotiated. Um, uh, increases in uh, municipal uh, worker wages, basically. Um, so I really think we need to push forward on this. Linda? Uh, insurance. Uh, yes. Would we be able to have some level of insurance on this? Should, should the ground move or shake and yes, or something? Yes, I believe you could get that. So and we I can could look get into that. We could get That's some additional point. insurance that might mitigate risk. You know, if we could insure it, at mm -hmm. least it wouldn't be on our tab. Yeah. We would be paying a premium for it, but. but I think if we if we tied it into our current Maya policy, that would spread the the uh, the exposure. I'll find that. 
please, because I think that that's one thing that we can do. I haven't looked at the foundation loadings, but I don't think it's that great. It's not like we're building a 50-story building. Right, that, right. You know, needs pilings that go down, you know, 200 feet or something. Um, this is basically distributed throughout the site. I'm just, I'm just talking no. about the insurance to try yep. to minimize risk. Why don't you make your comment? Eric McLean with American Capital and Energy. Um, the, the loading, uh, uh, Selectman Peters, correct. The, the, the loading is very minimal. In fact, we're restricted by the Department of Environmental Protection, and the town has already signed the, po signed the post closure use permit as the landowner and the landfill owner um, quite some months ago, for, and that approval has been, been approved. And our loading is less than five pounds per square inch on the entire landfill. So the, the likelihood from an engineering aspect of any shifts occurring. Is, is very minimal. I would say, unfortunately, this is one of those adders in language that just gets, in reality, is not really truly a risk, and it's just in there. Ed? And, and I would um, imagine when we take our tractor up to mow the grass, the, the loading on the, the wheels of the tractor are far in excess of anything. I, I haven't seen the tractor, but I would, I would anticipate no, it. <laughs> huh? No. What? No? What? What does a tractor weigh? I think walking. Just, I just, I just want to make sure I understand the gentleman's comment. What he said was uh, five pounds per square inch over the entire landfill. That does, that does not mean that that concrete block is actually putting five pounds per yeah, square the inch. Design, okay. the tractor tires are, are less than that. They're less than three. I mean that they're designed to go over turf and drive over things, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, so try this one on the sole of your foot, Leo. If each of us hop up and down, that's going to be more than uh, what this loading is. <laughs> that's not nice. That was the point. All right. Okay. So 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 we take we take a walk out there and we're putting more load on it than what they're saying the solar system's going to do. All right. So I think there, we're probably, yeah. Is everybody satisfied? With Very. Uh, you, well, no. I, I, I really have nothing to add to what, what's been said. You know, I, I was the CVEC representative. I am, am no longer, but I've been associated with this project since the, since the get-go. I'm confident in what, what's been said here and, and what has been presented. And, I, you know, th this is a, th this is really, a tremendous project for Harwich and for the for the, for the town and for, for for our ability to get some revenue, that meaningful revenue, that uh, is not going to cause any problem. And I I would certainly urge this board to approve that contract. Linda, the the wonderfulness of the project, and I love solar projects and wind turbines and trying to have renewable energy. I think I I I must say I'm still remaining a little cranky on the up against the wall, sign this or your project doesn't go through. And, I, you know, it's, it's it, it kind of belittles the whole concept of negotiating agreements. I understand you had a new financing person and blah, 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 blah. However, it's, it still makes me pretty cranky that I'm going to have to vote for this. I understand. I just want to make sure that you understand it's the state incentives that are causing the take it or leave it attitude. We don't want to have to impose that. The state is closing all of the programs, and if we can't move these projects forward now, they're done. And we were told last week that it was the financing people right. that were causing this. The financiers are, are the ones who are giving the language. The fact that we can't work with the towns to refine the language better to their liking is because of the state programs well, and the timing of the state programs. Okay. Let me make a suggestion how we you can keep us from being as cranky as we get, and, it, and it's difficult. When we, have an, when we have an agreement with you yeah. and there's another party involved and that party wants to change something, please call any one of us here or the town administrator and say, I just found out that we have to make the ink purple on the contract or, or whatever. That's where the major problem is. We you understand. Can, we and, do. and, and please, because I, my, my concern with dealing with CVAC has gone up tremendously. We never had a concern. We just went right forward and, and, and did, did everything. But this is a concern. So if you could bring that back and we can solve that problem, 
uh, then I think we've made a, a great step forward. I will bring it back. Thank you. And I don't want Linda cranky. Yeah, motion on the table. There's a motion and a second. Mr. Chair. I don't want me cranky. Mr. Chair. Yep. I'd, I'd like to offer an amendment to the motion to include in it that we all, we all additionally authorize the chair to sign the documents because that's the way they're set up. Right, set up. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Can we have another amendment, a second to that amendment, but also that we request the town administrator to write the letter as yep. he outlined indicating what things that how we were interpreting this as we signed this document thank you I'll include that in my amendment yeah. Is there a second? Second. I did I, so if you include that in your amendment I'll second that yeah. okay if okay. you all organized now Leo um, I've been up in front of you many times um, I as a taxpayer of the town of Howard do have an issue with you people signing this contract this evening. I ask that you not do it. I think you're putting at risk a great deal and for the simple reason of the amendment which you just approved to add to it. Okay, we're gonna sign this contract with a new language, but the new language means this to us, not that to us. This is not a game we're playing here. Don't treat it like a game. This is a contract, a legal contract. If you sign it, I don't care what you think it says, there'll be attorneys and lawyers deciding what it said. All well intended, but you're dealing with the town of Howitches, the residents of the town of Howitches land and their money. Do the right thing. Do the right thing on this one. Let it pass. I can't tell you how many times towns and officials, government, rush into things because they're, so, well, if we don't do it now, we're not going to get it later. Look what, look what our federal government is going through with this health care situation. Although it may be a wonderful, wonderful situation, but they signed it and tried to figure out how to make it work later, and now we can't even make it work, whether you agree with it or you don't agree with it. Do the right thing the first time around. Look how long you people have been dealing with this issue on one issue after another after another. And now you sit there and say, well, if you're going to have another change, at least tell us about it. I'm sorry. I asked you people not to join this group a year ago. And here you are still changing documents at this late hour and moving forward. You're probably not going to listen, but I wanted it on the record. Leo Kukunas is not in favor of this document. Any other comments? Ed? Well, uh, many years ago, I remember uh, standing in front of town meeting asking them to approve a housing development on uh, Driftwood Circle that I wasn't entirely to my liking. Um, uh, and one of the issues that we were dead set on maintaining was that the town would maintain ownership of that property. And over the process of developing that property, we slowly gave up that. And it's now the town no longer has ownership of that. Uh, you don't always know all the answers to every effort that you undertake at the beginning. Um, but you try and make the best decisions at the start and the best decisions as you move through the process. And I think uh, if you go over to Dr Driftwood Circle today and see the 13, I believe it's 13 houses that are there that are providing great housing for new residents of Harwich, I think we have did a very good thing. I think uh, a similar thing can be said over this project of installing uh, the solar panels at our landfill. Any other comments? No. Yeah. We have a motion and we have seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now move uh, the request of the Gulf Commission. 
I don't see anyone. I don't know if anyone's uh, here. I did talk with the chairman of the Gulf Commission this afternoon and reviewed what he had submitted or what it submitted from Brown and Lindquist. Oh. I'm not sure, actually, why you're, you have to deal with this. But in reading the, reading the documentation, it seems to me that this contract has just been adjusted to reflect the dates when studies, et cetera, were submitted. This is mostly past tense. It does try to um, talk about the 120 days, uh, not less than 120 days, to have the uh, project, this first phase of the project completed, which was August 31st. Uh, the budget, it defines this $500 in reimbursable expenses as opposed to the lump sum. I guess the architects wanted that. And then the other dates in Article 4, which have all passed. I think it comes to you because you originally negotiated it or signed it, I guess. And now you're asked to make these don't which so. don't no. seem to be significant changes. You did not. No. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was wrong. Did we? I don't recall that. I remember we had this in front of us, and uh, Peter, I believe it was, I had, had, had a bunch of comments and in, in here. and uh, many of the okay. changes that are in red are in are response to, to Peter's. I, I but, but the question is why now? I mean it seems yeah. like it's over with. <laughs> it does to me and that's why when I got it I was a little surprised but that was the explanation I was given. It was these were changes that either this board had asked for or the committee had asked so for and they've they made them and I guess us. Yeah. It's, your it's got dropped. It's work they done. Got First phase I believe is completed. They're moving on to the second, third, oh, yes, et cetera. We make a presentation on phase one so we know what they did. Excellent. Because basically they dropped the ball then is what it sounds like. Well, I think it's, I don't know if they dropped the ball, but uh, we didn't like the contract. Mm. We wanted some additional language added to the contract, and it's just apparently taken this long to get it here. But it, after this, but it was <laughs> after the work is done, I understand. Well, it's what's the work that I, in talking to Clem today, the work that's been done. Mm -hmm. the, in, in this is phase one. Mm -hmm. This doesn't cover phase two or phase three. In phase one, there is there was a um, the fir first part of phase one was. Um, sort of scoping out uh, what was to be done right. and then the second p the, the, the finish up part is uh, the design part actually putting pen to paper and doing the sketches and the drawings they have yet to do that um, they have done this the scoping por portion of it as, as far as I understand uh, from uh, Clem uh, this afternoon um, and they would like to, to move ahead, but quite honestly, this is where they start uh, uh, incurring uh, more staff time and costs and uh, would like to have this agreement in place before they send everybody uh, uh, working on it. They're, they are hoping to get this done in time so they can get a cost estimate and uh, uh, bring it in front of town meeting. Yeah. I'd ask them to come in and tell us what this is about. So. All right, we will schedule them in to tell you what they have sense. already done. Okay. So. I, so I would suggest you authorize, well, I think the board has to sign this, not me. I'm happy to sign it if you wish, but um, it is scheduled for the board to be signed based upon these amendments. Hey, I, I move we uh, sign the uh, contract in, in front of us. I I'll mean, it's already it. passed uh, work, so we might as well move ahead now and have them come in With next the appropriate week. language. Okay. Okay. I think the only thing I'd, I'd add is uh, we can't do business this way. No, you should not. I think we should kind of have the, you know, the old horse before the cart. Mm. Absolutely so I hope, correct. hopefully this won't happen again with any other contracts, that we make it clear to the departments and committees that you know, you right. kind of have to go A to B to C to D. What's the full value of this contract? I don't know. The only thing I've been presented with is, is 27500 There are other phases. I was not 
The construction phase, Given. I don't think, is known. No, no, I know that. I was just wondering yes. what this yes. is. Yes. That'd, that'd, that'd be the next RFP once yeah. they get this. Okay. So there's been a... During their, during their presentation, I would assume that they should make that. So in terms of how we you. play to move forward, Larry, you've recommended your yeah. motion. Yeah. There's a second. Second. Uh, and the, the, and we also are going to have a request for somebody to come in and Yes, sir. And cover I'll this. take care of that. Okay. If there's no further conversation, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Please. Okay. So it passes. What a one. Uh, we now, um, there's no new business, so we go to the town administrator's report. After all that? Yeah. No, uh, just a couple of quick updates. Uh, we are making um, good progress on our handicapped accessibility at, uh, at the community center that's completed, and we're working on uh, Brooks Library. That should be, I'll have the prices next week. Budgets have uh, started to come in. I'm starting to review those with Mr. Ryan uh, within the guidelines set by the Board of Selectmen. We have had a meeting on the middle school today on the parking traffic flow, and I believe, at least at our level, we resolve some issues that will then be presented to, uh, I think we're going to be presented to the full committee this evening, the middle school reuse committee. Uh, we met with the superintendent of schools, the principal at uh, at the middle school police department. Uh, I asked them to check with the fire department to make sure they were satisfied with what we had come up with, and I believe that has happened. And we'll also be si I'll be signing the contract for our new scheduling software for the various departments so that we can have accurate information on who's using what and when. And I think we'll be able to get that done within the next probably 10 to 15 days. On that, on that scheduling software, have we considered uh, we have rooms that are scheduled in this building, <coughs> rooms that are scheduled all over, have we considered moving all of that scheduling under one? That would be what I would hope to, to do. Um, Carol and I are talking about that. I think that is possible with input from outside so that people can get into it. Um, it's a system, this is not a system that we are inventing. Uh, what Carolyn did was look at uh, software that is used in various towns on Cape Cod. Uh, we received proposals. This is the lowest proposal, although one that she, and I'm not trying not to speak for you too much, but uh, did go to the communities that used it and got firsthand that they were satisfied with it and it is workable. We can also use credit cards with us system, um, which Carolyn is working on to finalize that. So I think it's a good system, and it will be able to cover all of the town buildings. That would be great. What? Larry? Uh, go ahead. I can know. Uh, okay. Uh, Bob, getting back to the uh, parking lot for the middle school. Yes. Uh, issue. Uh, to use uh, the expression we just heard, the cart before the horse, I'm a little concerned about getting uh, that uh, that too firmly set before we have an idea of who else is going to use that building and is it right. because there may be room for negotiation and reconfiguration depending on who is there so I, there I would hate to that be a to be an artificial be, barrier it will not be. To, I think uh, there was just some basics we needed to figure out one can you subdivide the property the answer is yes because there are the appropriate buffers around the middle school to allow that to be segregated as, as, a, as a separate parcel. The fields can be, uh, would not be part of any uh, sale yeah. or lease, I'm assuming you'd want to sell it. Uh, the issue was how can we limit access from whatever this, the middle school is going to be from the elementary school. It is not, I don't believe, appropriate to have people driving from, let's say it's a residence, through uh, the school property. I think there's a problem with that. You shouldn't mix those uses. Uh, the plan that was talked about today was to try to create, not at our expense, but at the developer's expense, um, an access road, for lack of a better word, that would go around the perimeter of the property closest to Sisson Road, which would allow all the traffic with student pickup, et cetera, to be contained within the property and not on the road, on then any the of the roads. school property. What would be the school property? Yes, with the access road bordering 
what we're going to right. sell or lease. That yes. sounds like a very good discussion. My point remains that right. I want to be sure that if that that's not a barrier to using oh. it until we have a discussion on what. I think as part of the bid that's going to be put out or the request for proposal is going to be broad enough to allow the developer Some to say to point. us, you need X, Y, or Z, or I can't do this, but I could do this for you. Right. Uh, use their expertise to try to design something that may be better. Yeah. But the, the person needs a parameter on what, what is the town's position that we want? What do we want? We need this access road. We need some new parking. Uh, the septic is in there. You know, that person is going to have to decide, do you want to use the existing? Do you want to build something new for the elementary school? Well, what what yeah, do you want to do? I mean, we shouldn't make that determination. Right. Uh, Ed, you had a comment. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, Larry's point's well taken because mm -hmm. I saw, did see the diagram of how that access road goes around and it, it skirts the property and it segregates the use. It also plates the access road right up against the property owners of all the residential property yeah. and, that on it. and there may be some uh, some other uh, modifications that the developer mm -hmm. could propose yeah. that wouldn't put all of that traffic right along somebody the side of somebody's house and across their backyard yeah. what I don't understand is is why they're keeping for the elementary school the route open to Sisson because they can just close that road bring everybody in, I guess it's South Street, oh. and, and do it that way, it, which is what I thought they were going to do. It's because a, that other road was only done r relatively recently. Well, they, it's a bunch of years now, when they, when they redid mm -hmm. the middle school. I mean, it's a whole different thing. And they were told at that time it was a problem. Well, the right well. answer. Well, that again the issue is if you if you are oriented all off of South Street, then all of the cars back up out on the South Street. Not uh, sure. Yes, they do. Uh, you know, you, that's the reality. And and by uh, bringing it off of Sisson, you allow a queuing line of great length, and you won't have the cars even backing out onto Sisson. The police department said that. South Street is is more narrow than Sisson Road, and it's going to cause more of a problem probably for fire and other people passing and repassing. It's a work in progress, but I think prog progress has I, been made. I want to be a, a work in progress while we yeah. go forward. Yeah. That's my so whole I think point. we're moving forward, and I think it's but probably if, a good But thing. if they came in on South and had a long enough loop and it went all the oh. way up to the other half, they can't do it with the roads they have now, but keep the loop on their side of that line, I think it solves both issues. The, the, we talked about the issue of trying to go around the school because the queuing line would have to go around the elementary school. There are some constrictions that I was, talk to, okay. that I was told of today by the planner and by the school. Again, this isn't the final word, but just wanted to report that we've had some meetings and things are at least moving in the right direction to get this, get this done. Yeah, because I'm, I'm with Angelo on the still using the access from Sisson and cutting through the property and going over, you know, if some of the proposals are going to be housing, mm -hmm. could be elderly housing, and I just have a, a, you know, you talk about the cars on, but I'd, I'd hate to see this line of cars twice a day uh, and having, you know, as somebody who's either oh. trying to cross no. and this and that. No, that's, it'd we be just, a totally different area. It would not interfere with that. You're correct. That would not be a good situation at all. It would have to be a different access yeah. driveway, whatever Absolutely. you'd like to call it. Abs oh, no, you cannot have the two. No, the two cannot sketch. mix. The sketch, there's the well, existing driveway. Well, I think driveway. it's but I, I, I'd like to see the sketch. Right. Oh, sure. Because uh, explaining it to me, I, I need no. to... Right. see the visual so I, I'd Just like to if we could see a quick update right. on that that yep. would be grand okay. but we're making progress so <laughs> that was the point <laughs> thank you you might also want it run and run it by the planning board they know something about parking lots uh, mr. Spitz was there so okay thank you All right, I guess we're down to uh, selectman's report uh, none for me. It's one to one. L Linda, anything for you? <laughs> it's one to one. Thanks, Larry. Linda. <laughs> uh, 
No, I don't have okay. anything to add. Access. All right. Uh, Still the town nurse. Okay. Uh, there are two town administrator issues. <clears throat> One is the, just the recruitment process, and we have this schedule, which now goes down through November 5th, which allows us three or four times for possible second interviews if we need them. We have absolutely no intention, obviously, of using all of them, but there's no way of knowing which one we need. So the, the thought was to post them, but we could always not use them. Uh, Lynn has also told me that in the November 2nd one, we're missing the word posted, which we will. November 1 one? Okay. And the second as well, yeah. Uh, Just make sure everything's posted. Okay. So that's, and uh, they should be all posted by the end of this week, except the November one. Any issues? Just a, a question, Angelo. Uh, you know, the, the time frame here, the recruitment process, the individuals will meet with some department heads. Okay. And then we will start interviewing at 1.30 in the afternoon. If there are three people, what do they do? Where are they going to be? You know, you know one interview is at, I don't know, 1.30, well, one is at 2.30, one is at 3.30. Where are these people going to be? And is that I all think, being handled? I think that's all being handled. But I think what's going to happen, quite, quite frankly, because of, of that situation, uh, there's going to be no way to hang on to everybody for three, three hours or four hours. So I think what we're going to do is uh, <laughs> allow, the, allow them to leave. And that what we will do after the meeting is we will sit down with Mark, go over, the offers that he'll get on the phone and call them. That wasn't my question. My question was, is somebody handling, I just, uh, I you've got somebody who's going to, you know, be done with lunch, et cetera, and are they, is it being handled that they're going to be somewhere waiting for their 1.30, 2.30, or 3.30 interview with us? We haven't, we haven't, we haven't worked that out. Okay. What we're trying to work out is what happens when they get here. Got it, okay. We're assuming that you know, but somebody is going to handle that so that they're not the issue is sitting outside, the yeah. sitting outside in the parking lot, right? Yeah. Well, one can go on the cranberry tour, and the other we can get. There we go. Our, our <laughs> community. They'll go to the community harbor center. master to take, take them on community. a harbor well, tour. Hey, we'll take. A, we'll do a harbor tour and a cranberry bog. That covers more. it. No, because well, one will be an interview. Well, we, well, well, we what we also need is during the three hours when we're interviewing, somebody has to bring them up and down. Mm -hmm. and take care of the ones that show up. So what we're in the process of trying to work that out. Okay. It's unfortunate <laughs> that the, uh, it's a Friday and the office is closed, which creates other issues. Yeah. But where they go, by the way, is, is probably we should, because we will have them all beforehand at lunch, and we should give them some options because there's no reason for anybody to sit here. They, they can go to they the community center, do whatever. Go to the library, go to library. The Brooks Academy. Yeah, Maybe we can get they, them open, go to Berlioz. I, I, seriously, for the record, if um, I will be available on that day, if um, where the town hall is closed, uh, I've already met the uh, candidates, so um, I'll be very happy to uh, give you my services as to keep them entertained, if you will, um, and then make sure they're back here before you, uh, I know, that's if you trust me with them. <laughs> well, maybe we want your wife, Andrea, to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a, you should have them. <laughs> and, and these are public interviews, so town hall will be open, like the doors, so somebody can come in yes. and listen yeah. to the interviews. Yeah. We'll sure. Just want to make sure of that, just that we don't have the doors all locked and okay. problematic. And they, they start at 1.30. We're starting at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, let's call it a meet and greet for one of better explanation for the applicants to come and meet individually with some selectmen and more importantly with a number of department heads to get a feel of what Horwich is like and, yeah. and uh, ask questions of what it's important in Horwich, what plans are going on, what's the major projects. And I think that'll be a, a, a helpful activity. We did it last time, and it worked out. And seemed to have worked out. Yep. And that's it. Okay. And we the, the choreography for Friday You're morning and Friday uh, afternoon has not been completed. In terms of uh, the afternoon, 
each of the selectmen are going to have to work out with the department head who stays to meet them where you're driving to the person to the next you know but that's just choreography we can do that and that's it if uh, Ed, do you have any comments no peter Thank you. well then does somebody want to adjourn so move to adjourn is there a second favor Play ball.